Good morning and welcome to the Landmarks Preservation Commission's October 18th, 2022 public hearing and public meeting. Okay, we, apologies we, for that. We are live on YouTube. Okay. We will begin by taking attendance and I will turn it over to our general counsel, Mark Silverman, to call the roll. Chair Carroll? Here. Vice Chair Bland? Here. Commissioner Shamir Barron? Here. Commissioner Chapin? Here. Commissioner Chen? Here. Commissioner Devonter? Here. Commissioner Goldblum? Commissioner Gustafson? Here. Commissioner Jefferson? Commissioner Lutfi? Here. Commissioner Holford Smith? All right, good morning again, and welcome again to the public hearing of and public meeting of October 18th, 2022. This meeting is being held via Zoom and live streamed on our YouTube channel. So if you would like to testify on any hearing items, you may do so by joining the Zoom meeting at the estimated time shown on our public hearing and public meeting agenda, which can be found on our website. And if you would just like to watch the proceedings, you may do so on our YouTube channel. Um, this, we have a number of items today. We are going to start today with a public hearing on a proposed uh, his designation for a historic district. And then we will move to a public meeting for applications for work on designated properties that have already had a public hearing and are back today with some changes. And finally, we will move to our public hearing for new applications on work with on designated properties. And to start the morning, I'm going to turn it over to Kate Lemos McHale, our Director of Research, to take us through the proposed designation item. Thank you, Sarah. Good morning, everybody. Item number one on the Research Department agenda this morning is LP 2664, the proposed Melrose Parkside Historic District in Brooklyn, with boundaries shown in this presentation and described in the agenda. And um, presenting this morning is Marianne Percival. Good morning, everyone. The proposed Melrose Parkside Historic District is a remarkably cohesive and intact group of 38 single and two family duplex row houses designed by two of Brooklyn's most prominent architects, Benjamin Driesler and Axel S. Hedman, and for the developers, William A. A. Brown and Eli H. Bishop and Son, and built between 1909 and 1915. The proposed district is located on Parkside Avenue between Flatbush and Bedford Avenues in the Flatbush neighborhood of Brooklyn. Of the 38 houses within the proposed district, 20 were constructed as two family duplexes, sometimes referred to as Kinko houses, a distinctive residential building type that originated in Brooklyn, shown here on the left. The other 18 houses were constructed as single family row houses. As was noted when the proposed historic district was calendared on August 9th, 2022, it has been identified through surveys and in response to a request from property owners to evaluate it, accompanied by letters of support, including from the former borough president and a petition signed by property owners. Research department staff reviewed it both on its own and within a broader study of the neighborhood. And this in-depth study found that the proposed district stands out within the neighborhood for its highly intact architectural quality and impressive collection of distinctive row houses. We have done considerable outreach and have had a number of conversations with property owners, most recently a virtual meeting in September on what it means to be designated. The name Melrose Parkside is a reflection of the district's history. In 1883, local physician and real estate speculator, Homer L. Bartlett, purchased Melrose Hall, an 18th century manor house and estate located between today's Parkside Avenue here that designated on this map as Robinson Street and Winthrop Street, the block to the north. For a suburban development, he planned to call Melrose Park. The pro projected development went unrealized and in 1886, Bartlett sold most of the property to the wealthy brewer and speculator, William Brown. Already active in real estate development in Brooklyn, Brown's son, William Arthur Alexander Brown, began the transformation of the family's holdings following his father's death in 1905. 
Around 1908, the long-mapped Robinson Street was opened and Brown petitioned the city to rename it Parkside Avenue for its connection to Prospect Park and Ocean Parkway. The map shows development on the block by 1912. Benjamin Driesler designed the two rows of duplexes completed in 1910 and a row of single family houses on, to the east completed in 1912. The dominant house type within the proposed district is the two family duplex, an unusual type of row house apparently unique to Brooklyn and popular between 1905 and 1915. This house type originated in Brooklyn in 1905, developed by the Kings and Westchester Land Company and marketed as Kinko houses. Shown on the right are examples of early Kinko houses in the Crown Heights North Three historic district. They were intended as an alternative to the conventional two family row houses of the late 19th century, such as those shown on the left in the Sunset Park South historic district, which appeared indistinguish indistinguishable from single family brownstones. Designed to offer greater privacy, each Kinko house has, was a true duplex with two totally separate two-story apartments, each with its own private entrance. Envisioning Parkside Avenue as an exclusive neighborhood of elegant duplex homes, William A. A. Brown began his project in 1909 at the peak of the duplex's popularity. That year, a Brooklyn Eagle article on Brown's new houses called them quote, the latest type of modern house building, end quote, with artistic and buried fronts of fine architectural design. Brown marketed his new duplex houses on Parkside Avenue as, quote, the most perfect houses ever built for two families, yet with the privacy of a one family house. Drawing upon the classical vocabulary, Architect Benjamin Driesler composed six distinct designs to create what were noted in 1909 advertisements as the most artistic fronts in Greater New York, with interiors to match. Each house features twin entrances at the first story, facades with or without bowed or angled bays, and mansard roofs punctuated by dormers in a variety of configurations. The prominent bulkheads are original features intended to give the residents of the upper apartments access to the roof. In addition, he designed the standalone property at Bedford and Parkside Avenues, seen here in the image on the right at the very far right, taking advantage of the corner site to vary the design by placing each entrance on a separate facade. As interest in the duplex declined due to the expense of construction, Brown in 1912 again turned to Benjamin Driesler to design a row of eight single family houses which he marketed as easy housekeeping, no basement houses. With deep open areaways, the row features full width terraces and shorter stoops, and an eclectic combination of classically inspired design elements with Jacobean style stepped gables. They were the last houses in the proposed district developed by Brown, who that same year announced his retirement from real estate to concentrate on his brewery business. In late 1913, Eli H. Bishop and son purchased the undeveloped parcel on the north side of Parkside Avenue for the construction of 10 single family residences. Designed in the neoclassical style by Axel S. Hedman in 1914 and completed in 1915, the American basement plan houses at 357 to 375 Park Ave Parkside Avenue alternate flat angled or bowed fronts with prominent central entrances flanked by a window and a service entrance. This map shows the historic typology of the row houses with the two rows of Kinko houses by Driesler built in 1909 and 1910 shown in orange and the rows of single family row houses that were built subsequently in yellow. All 38 houses, including the two family duplex houses remain well preserved. The only notable changes have been to the front yards and a few other minor alterations such as replacement of doors, windows and roofing materials. The demographics of Parkside Avenue reflect the historical trends of Flatbush through the 20th and into the 21st century. Promoted in early advertisements as an exclusive neighborhood, residents of the row houses and duplexes on Parkside Avenue through the 1950s were white and predominantly born in the United States, 
and included households headed by doctors, lawyers, engineers, teachers, businessmen, musicians, and artists. Among the bloc's longtime residents were Ella Boole, an ardent prohibitionist and president of the world's Women's Christian Temperance Union, who lived at 377 Parkside Avenue from 1922 until her death in 1952, and Anthony R. Savarese, an Italian-born artist and designer, and his family, who lived at 292 Parkside Avenue from 1927 to 1980. Following a trend that was seen in other residential communities, some residents began sharing their large apartments with roomers, boarders, and lodgers in the 1920s. And beginning in the 1930s, many of the duplexes were being subdivided into multiple rental units or combined office and residences for the many doctors who moved into the district by 1950. By the mid 20th century, Flatbush saw a large increase in African-American and Afro-Caribbean residents as black families moved into the area from other neighborhoods in New York City, such as Central Harlem and Bedford Stuyvesant. Central Brooklyn soon became the center of the city's Afro-Caribbean community, and by the 1980s was a major destination for immigrants from the Caribbean countries. Today, Parkside Avenue continues to reflect the diversity of greater Flatbush. United by their classically inspired, inspired design elements and uniformly deep fronts, front yards and areaways, the two family duplexes with their twin entrances and single family houses created a distinct sense of place that has remained intact for more than a century and distinguishes the proposed Melrose Parkside historic district within the larger Flatbush area. The commission voted to calendar the proposed district on August 9th, 2022 and the staff welcomes public testimony at today's hearing. Thank you. Thank you, Marianne. All right, commissioners, do we have any questions for Kate or Marianne at this point? Yes, Commissioner Lutfi, please go ahead. This is very exciting, um, but I just have some general questions about um, the buildings seem wide, and I was just wondering if you could give us a sense of what the width and depth of the buildings are, and maybe what the ceiling heights are, just so we have a, set, a better sense of um, the structures. Um, I will have to look that up for you, Commissioner Lutfi. Um, you can see that, and as far as the uh, ceiling heights, we have not yet found the plans. Mm -hmm. So it's hard to judge what that would be. I don't have a tax map. To yeah, I think we can pull up the lot sizes for you to answer that. I just yeah. don't have it handy. Yeah. yeah, it can happen at another time. Just, okay. Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. I, as I looked at the the street and the, you know, the rhythms of the building and the sizes of the windows. And they're just all very interesting. So they're interesting and a different scale than yeah, more of it, the traditional row houses that we have designated absolutely. in many districts. Yeah. And we are working with the Department of Buildings to try to get the plans for those. Yeah. And working at first. It's fantastic. Years. They're lovely. And it's so great that we're doing it. Yeah. That's great. We were able um, to get um, plans for the small uh, no basement houses and the corner house. And so we can def we definitely have that at those at hand, but it's the, the main ones that we do not have anything. For. Right. Yeah. We're working on it. Okay. And um we're really excited to be bringing it forward. This is certainly a block that stands out. This portion of this block really stands out when you're there. Um, and we undertook this request, uh, this uh, review at the request of community members. Um, we received an initial request from members of the Parkside Avenue Block Association. And we uh, have received a number of letters in support and we uh, you know, appreciate those letters. Um, we've done a lot of outreach here. As Marianne mentioned, we had property owner meetings to talk about what it means to be designated in July of 2021. And again, 
this past September and they were both well attended. And we have also gotten individual phone calls and have talked to a number of individual people. And we appreciate the active engagement of so many in the community. We've heard a lot of moving words of support, which I think really sort of has motivated our, our work here. And um, I know we did receive a number of letters for testimony today, which have been shared with you all. And I think we have a number of speakers signed up to uh, read some of those letters into the record today. So we'll move to public testimony. And um, am I Lisa or Sonia or Greg Gregory, am I running, turning it over to you? Yes. Gregory, we'll start today. Okay, great, thanks. So I'm gonna turn it over to Gregory Kala to take us through the testimony. Uh, thank you so much, Chair Carroll. So uh, if you could please raise your hands now if you would like to speak on this issue, I will be uh, moderating that. Okay, thank you all very much. So the first one on our speaker sign up list is uh, Michael Lent. So Michael, I will be promoting you to panelists now. Okay. So if you could just unmute your line, you will have three minutes to speak and just make sure you announce your name for the record. Okay, can you see me and hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, I can't see anyone else, but it's fine. Um, I'd like to thank the commission for uh, holding this public hearing on the Melrose Parkside Historic District. Really appreciate it. My name is Michael Lent. I live at 393-395 Parkside Avenue, along with my wife who's sitting next to me, Diane, who did a lot of the initial research back in 2015 and 16, and our co-owners, Jennifer Levy and Paul Schwab. Our home is one of the Kinko homes designed and built in 1909 to 1910. We have lived at 393-395 Parkside for the past 22 years. We bought our home in 1999 and moved here in 2000. We were attracted to the block because of the beautiful historic homes, the diversity of the neighborhood, and the wel welcoming neighbors we met. Many people, both homeowners and renters, have lived on the block for many years. We have a wonderful block association that has fostered a strong sense of community. Starting in 2015, we became aware that developers had determined that the neighborhood we are in was an up and coming one and started buying homes in adjacent lots on other blocks, tearing them down and building new multifamily dwellings, often not in keeping with the neighborhood's or block's character. The dwellings torn down included wonderful old brick and stone homes. This concerned many of our homeowners and resulted in a group of homeowners providing the New York City Landmark Commission with information on the historic and uni unique nature of the homes on our block and gaining the support of many of the block's homeowners. We put in an application for landmarking in 2016. We petitioned for landmarking status several more times over the past six years, including updating our application with new signatures of support from homeowners to the commission in 2018, and then again in 2021. I wanna say we're willing to do the extra work necessary to submit for staff review the work we do on the front of our home as a worthwhile trade-off because the preservation of the character of the community, which architect, its architectural nature and historic nature is part of that character is of vital importance to us. Importance to us. We truly appreciate the extensive work the commission staff has done in detailing the historic nature of the block. We request that the New York City Landmarks Preservation Commission support and move forward the creation of the Melrose Parkside Historic District. Thank you. Thank you very much, Michael. And so the next person on our sign up seat is Andrea Goldwyn from New York Landmarks Conservancy. So Andrea, I will be making you panelists now. So if you could just state your name for the record, unmute your line, you'll have three minutes to speak. Thank you. Thanks, Gregory. Uh, good morning, Chair Carroll and Commissioners. I'm Andrea Goldwyn speaking on behalf of the New York Landmarks Conservancy. The Conservancy is so pleased to support designation of the Melrose Parkside Historic District. 
This district features such an impressive group of intact residential buildings whose history mirrors this section of Brooklyn. The area evolved from a rural outpost to a dense residential neighborhood following transportation improvements in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. These row houses were completed in uh, between 1909 and 1915. Designed by prominent Brooklyn architects, they're excellent examples of the revival styles typical of the era, including uh, colonial revival, single family houses, and the grand Renaissance revival duplexes. That duplex configuration had a brief heyday during this period, and these houses are notable for their separate entrances responding to growing expectations of privacy. All houses in the proposed district maintain their original height and scale with fine details and decorative elements. Overall, uh, this, uh, this part of this charming block has a special sense of place and expands our understanding of Brooklyn history. It clearly merits the recognition and guidance of the Landmarks Commission, and we urge you to move swiftly and take a vote to designate the Melrose Parkside Historic District. The Conservancy is happy to offer building owners assistance from our technical services and historic properties fund programs. Thank you for the opportunity to express the Conservancy's views. Great. Thank you so much, Andrea. Uh, we will now be moving over to Brenda Edwards. So Brenda, I will be promoting you to panelists now. So if you could please unmute your line and state your name for the public record, I will. you will have three minutes to speak. Okay, I'm sorry. Hello? Hi, Brenda. Oh, hi. Okay, I had to unmute myself. Brenda Edwards. Okay, I'll give my testimony. The residents of Parkside Melrose have been working closely together to ensure that their historical homes and traditions survive in a community that has seen new and too often oversized development replace what could have been historical districts that maintain the pride and character of the community. Parkside Melrose is a gem in the Prospect Leffitt's Gardens community and reflects what it means to be committed to one's neighbors and their traditions. It is a beautiful, charming, and well-kept block featuring townhouses or row houses that have been built since the early 1900s. As a resident of Chester Court, which has been a historic district since 2014, I understand the exhilaration after such hard work for your block to be nominated as part of a history of a thriving community. It renews faith in agencies such as LPC and encourages us to continue to raise our families and build relationships with our neighbors without the threat of our homes being destroyed. We begin to feel safe and respected in a community that we have come to love. Therefore, the Chester Court Block Association looks forward to the formal announcement that Parkside Melrose has joined us as a historic district. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, Brenda. And we will now be hearing from Robert Marvin. So Robert, I will be promoting you to panelists now. So if you could please unmute your line, state your name for public record, you will have three minutes to speak. Thank you. My name is Robert Marvin. I'm president of the Lefferts Manor Association and a resident of Midwood Street in the Prospect Lefferts Gardens Historic District. The Lefferts Manor Association strongly supports the designation of the Melrose Parkside area of Flatbush, Brooklyn, as an historic district. The Lefferts Matter Association was founded in 1919 by a group of neighborhood residents. Lefferts Manor lies in close proximity to the proposed Melrose Parkside Historic District. Uh, in 1979, the commission designated a portion of Prospect Lefferts Gardens as an historic district, and Lefferts Manor encompasses the greater portion of that district. Melrose Parkside is three blocks south of Lefferts Manor. As close neighbors of the proposed Melrose Parkside District, Lefferts Manor residents are aware of the outstanding, architecturally significant homes in this district. Through the years, the residents of Melrose Parkside and Lefferts Manor have shared a sense of community. 
The Lefferts Manor Association has sponsored tours of homes in Prospect Lefferts Gardens, including homes within Melrose Parkside. Neighbors from the nearby historic districts of Ocean on the Park and Chester Court have also opened their homes for these tours. For many years prior to the pandemic, these tours welcomed <coughs> hundreds of neighbors and visitors from around the city each year to view homes in these historic districts, as well as homes in the larger area of Prospect Lefferts Gardens. These house tours celebrated the styles of architecture that contribute to the special character of this area of Flatbush. The Lefferts Manor Association continues to work to preserve the sense of community and history that exists in this area of Flatbush, Brooklyn, which is shared with neighbors on Parkside Avenue and so is glad to enthusiastically support the historic designation of Melrose Parkside. On a personal note, I worked to help achieve the Prospect Lefferts Gardens Historic District in the 1970s. My biggest disappointment when that district was designated by the commission in 1979 was the omission of this block of Parkside Avenue, which had been in the original proposed Prospect Lefferts Gardens Historic District. The continued preservation of these houses is in part a tribute to the perseverance of the homeowners there, but it's also attributable to simple good luck. We cannot count on such luck continuing indefinitely. I therefore urge the commission to act expeditiously on the designation of this proposed historic district. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much for that. Uh, we will now be hearing from Deanna Lenhart. So Deanna, I will be promoting you to panelists now. So if you could please unmute your line, state your name for public record, you will have three minutes to speak. Thank you. Hello, Deanna. Hi, can you hear me? We can Sorry, hear. It, it took a minute for my computer to switch over to panelists. Um, hi, I am Deanna Linhart. I'm a, a longtime resident of the greater Flappish area, um, the way I've lived on this block since 2017. Um, I have raised my kids in the area and continue to do so on Parkside Avenue. Um, I believe that landmarking um, is the only way to preserve the historical and architectural integrity of the block as well as the quality of life. I am a real estate broker by profession. So I have seen firsthand um, how a developer or investor can come in and uh, quickly ruin the integrity of a neighborhood or a block. And to be honest, it's surprising that hasn't already happened here, given that the block is zoned for six, six stories. Um, to answer one of the questions that was previously asked about the depth and width of the houses, um, I live in one of the Kinko houses and it is 20 feet wide by 50 feet long and the ceilings are 10 feet tall. Um, I also wanted to say that I've worked in the industry for 15 years and the number of times I have had uh, two families come to me uh, to approach me to try to find them a two family home with equally sized apartments. Um, it, they're, they're, they just don't exist. <laughs> very, very, uh, they're very, very difficult to find. And I think that speaks to the unique nature of how these homes were originally constructed. Um, I also heard it mentioned earlier that um, someone said a great number of the homes had already been converted to multi four family homes, but actually a great number of them still are functioning as two family homes. And what living in those homes means is that there are two equally sized family homes, uh, two duplexes that are usually three bedrooms, two baths. And that is a very unique thing to find in the neighborhood. I understand that some of my um, fellow residents may be hesitant to um, support the landmarking because it does add an extra step to the process of getting done, you know, work done on the exterior of the home. But I would argue that the trade-off um, 
for not landmarking the block is much more inconvenient and much more disruptive than going through a minor application process. I want to thank the commission for considering this block. And I just want to stress again, our family's support of it. And um, hopefully this will be accomplished expeditiously. Well, great, thank you so much, Deanna. Hi, Gregory, I'm sorry to interrupt. I did see that Assemblymember Cunningham has joined us. So perhaps he could speak next. Oh, of course, yes. All right, assembly member, I'll be promoting you to panelists now. And if you can please unmute your line and state your name for the record, you'll have three minutes to speak. Good morning. Thank you so much. My name is Brian Cunningham, and I have the unique pleasure of representing Merrill's Parkside in the New York State Assembly. Um, just want to come on to echo my support for the community and this historic preservation also want to thank the Landmarks Preservation Committee for taking up this application and doing their due diligence and the community for really advocating and pushing for this historic designation. Um, I've lived in this community my entire life. I am not a resident of the block, but I represent the block. And I've seen our community change over and over and over again because of unscrupulous developers who've swooped in and changed the context of our communities. I think this preservation and this designation is really important um, for the preservation of our community and what it looks like now and its historic significance to our community. Um, just want to, again, echo not um, to regurgitate the points that have already been made by everyone, but just to echo my support publicly for this designation. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Assembly Member. Mark Gregory, I'll turn it back over to you. OK, great. Thank you. Uh, the next person on the list will be Suzanne Spellen. So Suzanne, I will be promoting you to panelists now. So if you could please uh, unmute your line, state your name for the record, you will have three minutes to speak. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, great. My name is Suzanne Spellen. I'm a writer and an architectural historian specializing in Brooklyn. I've worked with the Lefferts Manor Association and other members of the Prospect Lefferts Gardens community on issues of preservation and landmarking. Uh, due to the many factors that make up this area's history, Prospect Lefferts Gardens is one of Brooklyn's most unique neighborhoods with a fascinating mixture of architectural styles found nowhere else. The proposed Melrose Parkside Historic District is long overdue. These buildings have been some of Prospect Lefferts Garden's most impressive buildings, and this is one of my favorite blocks in the entire neighborhood. I commend the determination and hard work of the organizations, block associations, and individuals who've worked for years in getting this block landmarked. The efforts of neighbors, preservationists, and championing and preservationists in championing, champ, ugh, championing this HD for many years has been impressive. Uh, the double duplex houses are a visual delight. Um, it's wonderful that they're on both sides of the block, which is very rare, and they're the perfect city houses, a duplex for an owner with a separate entrance and address for the other duplex. Axel Hedman's single family houses are equally good. The age of the single family row house was ending at this time, but Hedman, who is one of Brooklyn's most prolific architects, uh, just showed that he still had plenty of imagination left, adding to the varied collection of row houses he designed in this neighborhood. The talent on this block is impressive and it needs to be protected and preserved. I wholeheartedly support the designation of the Melrose Parkside Historic District. Incidentally, Chair Lutvi, the, uh, as the neighbor said, the duplex houses are 20 by 50. The single family houses are 17 by 50 and the Hedman houses are 20 by 59. So um, they're wonderful. Please designate them. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, Suzanne. The next speaker on our list is, uh, let me see, Cheryl Seeley. So Cheryl, I'll be promoting you to panelists now. So if you could please unmute your line and state your name for the record, you will have three minutes to speak. Can you hear me? 
Yes, we can hear you. Okay. Thank you. Good morning, commissioners, neighbors, and community. My name is Cheryl Seeley. I am a longtime resident and a homeowner of Parkside Avenue. I have watched our community decimated by overdevelopment. Homes and adjoining blocks destroyed to make way for new and out of context development. Parkside Avenue can also suffer the same fate. Residents have fought to maintain the integrity and character of their homes. I am not against any homeowners selling their homes. However, I would hope that whomever purchases a home would not just wipe out, wipe out its originality, but maintain the character and integrity. I urge the commission to vote yes to our landmark request on Parkside Avenue. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. Uh, we will now be hearing from uh, Kurt Flamer called the, uh, actually uh, Julie Miller. So Julie, I will be promoting you to panelists now. So if you could unmute your line and state your name for the public record, you will have three minutes to speak. Thank you so much. Thank you. And again, I thank you the commission for bringing this proposal forward. My name is Julie Miller. Uh, with my husband, we bought uh, 359 Parkside in 1984. And we bought the house because we thought it was the most beautiful house in the most beautiful block. And we I wasn't aware of the unique um, appearance of these houses and architecture for a few years, but we, we were one of those houses that was on the house tour that Bob mentioned uh, for four or five times. And in doing that, we read about the history of our houses. And I also looked around Brooklyn and realized there weren't that many houses or that many rows of houses that look like the ones on our block. I feel so strongly that this is a unique opportunity that's long overdue to be part of the landmark blocks that are have already been landmarked around us. I also feel that we're very um, stable and tight knit community. And I, my sense is that it's not just the homeowners who love living on Parkside, that there's an appreciation for the historic quality of the block from many of the residents who are living in the apartments as well. So thank you. That's Thank you so much, Julie. Uh, we will now be hearing from Kurt Flamer Caldera. So Kurt, I will be promoting you to panelists now. So if you could please unmute your line and state your name for the public record, you will have three minutes. This guy's wearing a Yankee shirt. Mm -hmm. Hello, Kurt. Unmute. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you to the commission for uh, arranging this public hearing. Um, it's a good opportunity that um, people who have been opposed to this um, can can voice themselves. I, um, from the very outset, when the um, petition was brought around, I was opposed because when my wife and I bought this, we loved the um, the location, the, the history of the area, the uh, quality of the building and also the absence of a landmarking. Um, not because we want to see things demolished, because we are very opposed to that, but we are opposed to um, the imposition of a bunch of requirements that invariably cost a whole lot more to uh, implement. Um, and I just wanted to address, uh, Chair Carroll had uh, recounted the process that went on to get to this point, and I do want to mention that this was not voted on by the uh, Parkside Avenue Block Association. It was a contentious issue and we decided to go our separate ways. So the suggestion that the association is in favor is inaccurate. Some members are, but the entire association is not. Um, I had uh, written and submitted um, a much longer um, statement. And thanks to Benjamin Wallen, who's been helpful in helping me overcome some of the glitches and navigating the maze of uh, connections here. Um, I believe that will be forward to you and I, and I appeal to your attentiveness to read that in its entirety. Um, I and a number of other um, 
owners here on the block who actually live on the block um, are opposed to the idea of of coming under the, the scrutiny and control of the um, historical requirements. Um, it's not that we want to change it or damage it. Uh, I think it's just unnecessary. I think our concern, I think the very common concern that we all have is that there might be a demolition. And um, I think there are, and I know there are ways, legal mechanisms such as deed restrictions and restrictive covenants that can prevent that without having to impose the, um, the much more extensive and frankly micromanagerial elements of the um, of the Landmark and Preservation Commission's um, guidebooks and, and regulations. So um, I would hope that you take into account the fact that um, there is not consensus here as um, council member Joseph, I understand has communicated to you, she said, uh, or her office told me already communicated to the Landmarks Preservation Commission that a number of residents are opposed to landmarking and that there is not a consensus among neighbors surrounding landmarking at Parkside. And I was well, I welcome that because it was a ne necessary redress to the letters sent by uh, Senator Parker and uh, former um, council member Eugene, who I think were um, swayed by an active group on our block who was being favor in favor of it uh, without taking into account the number of people who are not. So I do hope you take into account the um, interests and motivations of all of the people here who live here and who don't wish to uh, pay the pre premium price of um, you know creating an architectural museum on our block thank you i appreciate the opportunity great thank you so much kurt and next we will be hearing from norma williams so norma i will be promoting you to panelists now so if you could please unmute your line, state your name for the public record, you will have three minutes to speak. Hello, Norma. Okay, I think we may have lost Norma. So I will be moving to the uh, next person on the list. That is uh, Lucy Levine. So Lucy, I will be promoting you to panelist now. And if you could unmute your line and state your name for the public record, you will have three minutes to speak. Thank you. Hello, my name is Lucy Levine speaking for the Historic Districts Council. Um, thank you so much. As the citywide advocate for New York's historic neighborhoods, HDC enthusiastically supports the designation of the Melrose Parkside Historic District. This remarkably intact and cohesive group of 38 single and two family neoclassical row houses built between 1909 and 1915 reflects the early 20th century residential development of Flatbush. While most of the LPC's district designations in Flatbush recognize freestanding Victorian homes or single family row houses, the Melrose Parkside Historic District offers recognition for a distinguished group of duplex two-family homes Riesler, a Flatbush resident and one of the area's most prolific and celebrated architects. The proposed district also includes eight single-family row houses by Driesler, embellished with Jacobean-style gables, and 10 American basement row houses designed by Axel Hedman, embellished with neoclassical detail. This block was an advocacy focus of HDCs as part of our selection of Prospect Lefferts Gardens as a 2017 Six to Celebrate area. The block members have worked diligently with their neighbors to gain support for the designation, and we are so pleased that this worthy area is moving forward in the process. There is much to celebrate in Flatbush, and in addition to our preservation work in Prospect Lefferts Gardens, this year HDC is honored to be working with Caribbean in the Little Caribbean neighborhood as a six to celebrate partner. HDC hopes the Landmarks Commission will continue to recognize the historic, architectural, and 
and to make additional designations aligned with the goals of community advocates. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much. And our final speaker will be Brent A. Butler. Uh, so Brent, I will be promoting you to panelists now. So if you could please unmute your line, state your name for the public record, you will have three minutes to speak. Thank you. My name is Brent Butler, and I um, was born on Parkside Avenue. Am I coming in clearly? Yes, you're coming in clear. Good, thank you. Uh, I hold a degree in urban planning um, and a degree in design studies from the Graduate School of Design in the University of Washington, and I'm a certified planner. Um, I was born on Parkside Avenue in the 1960s, and my mother is likely the street's oldest long-term resident. She still lives at uh, 380 Parkside Avenue. I am supportive of this designation uh, for several reasons, which I will elucidate. Uh, my mother um, was the block president uh, in the late 1970s, and again in the late 19, in the early 1980s. Um, I organized um, um, two tree plantings. The uh, earliest um, was roughly 1982. Many of the trees are now mature. And then a later tree planting in the late, um, in the 1990s. Um, what I recognized over the past few years is that uh, um, without historic designation, um, the concerns that I've heard um, emphasized by some members of the community, I have found uh, um, would um, not um, be realized. Uh, I have come to believe that uh, the designation of the properties uh, as historic and also the allocation of resources uh, to enable residents uh, to access low interest loans to repair facades. And um, I would highlight my mother's long desire to replace the roof um, and put a roof that was originally designed to be on uh, our building um, as being a prohibitive uh, cost, but something that she had for uh, 40 years desired. Um, in my role as a, a planning uh, director, I have um, approved and recommended uh, historic uh, designations uh, for the express purpose of being able to allocate and obtain resources. Um, in one such community that had done an inventory, um, the city of East Palo Alto in California, where I served as the planning director, that an inventory of all of the historic structures done in the 1990s was not revisited for some 20 years. At that point, roughly, 30 to 40% of those buildings designated as historic no longer existed. This is a fear that I have in our community. Um, it had been for many years discussed that the building adjacent to my mother's would be demolished to make a parking access for a new building on Clarkson. It is these types of, of uses that um, I feel have a long-term impact in both from the perspective of intergenerational equity in terms of providing future generations a visual look back into the past, um, as well as um, intragenerational equity in enabling our residents of today to see um, the varied histories of our community. I sense that this application is a good step and a good step now. I, I would welcome um, the designation as would my family. I, I am speaking on behalf of, of my sister and my brother uh, and my brother um, continues to live on Parkside and uh, updated me about this meeting. Hi, Brent, I'm terribly, 
Brent, I'm terribly sorry. Uh, if we could wrap this up, please. You're above three minutes. So thank you. Um, and I just wanted to also just acknowledge those that have worked so hard um, to make this designation a reality. Uh, I send you uh, my greetings and I truly appreciate your hard work. Thank you. Thank you so much, Brent. Uh, I see that Norma has rejoined the talk, so I will promote Norma Williams once again to panelists. Hopefully this will work. So Norma, if you could please uh, unmute your line and state your name for public record, uh, you will have three minutes to speak. Thank you. Good morning. Hi, Norma. Yes, good morning. I don't know if you can hear me. I'm away and I'm really trying to see how best I can do this by telephone. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, great, great. So I, my name is Norma Williams and I live with my husband, Rollin Williams and children at 371 Parkside Avenue. We bought our home in February of 1978. So we have been there for 44 years. And I want to thank the commissioners this morning and the foregoing speakers who have spoken in a very positive light in support of designation of landmarking of the proposed Melrose Parkside District. I must say that Parkside is unique. The unique architectural design has been mentioned by so many people. I know Michael Lent and Deanna have given extensive report as to what the block holds. And I just want to say that my family and I are in total support of this, and we hope that a positive vote will be given. Parkside is unique in so many ways. And one of my fear, and yes, I do fear, do use the word fear, is that what is beautiful can be destroyed. And so I'm speaking, you know, with the hope that this designation will come into fruition, that it will be passed. And I thank everyone who has been in support of it. I too would like, like the previous person who spoke on behalf of his family to maintain what we have for future generation. Like I said before, I have my children, they have written letters of support just to say what Parkside means to them. And I really love the fact that we are doing this and it is indeed my prayer, yes, that it will come through. So again, thank you everyone who is in support of this. Thank you commissioners for hearing us this morning. And I hope that the vote will be positive. Thank you. Thank you so much, Norma. And we do have one additional speaker. Her name is Virginia Bechtold. So Virginia, I will be promoting you to panelists now. So if you could please unmute your line and state your name for a public record, you will have three minutes to speak. Okay, great, thank you. Um, thank you so much for calendaring this request. Um, I was on, or I was in the initial or some of the initial meetings in 2018. So I realized that it's been, you know, four years, six years since this has been discussed and it's, um, it's heartening to see that, um, my neighbor's hard work has come to fruition. I live at 530 Parkside, so the other side of Bedford Avenue. Um, I'm a tenant. Even though I know that landmarking will probably like, you know, make the rents in this neighborhood continue to rise. Um, I am in support of landmarking this particular section of Parkside. Uh, I think it's great that um, the original proposal from the 70s that included it will now, you know, be more complete. And yeah, um, it's also wonderful to see more of the research. Um, I did a lot of it for a report back in 2018, um, be even more fleshed out by your commissioners. So yeah, I'm in support 
I'm also part of the Prospect Leopard Gardens Neighborhood Association, which has been supporting um, homeowners and tenants and merchants in this neighborhood since the 60s. Um, so yeah, even though there are some negative uh, ramifications of landmarking for tenants in this neighborhood, uh, I do support the landmarking efforts, but you know, with the caveat that more needs to be done to uh, protect everybody in this neighborhood and their housing. Thanks. Great. Well, thank you so much, Virginia. And uh, those are all the speakers that we have. Uh, in addition to those speakers, I would like to note that we received 15 additional letters uh, regarding historic this historic district. 11 were from residents in support of this historic district. One was another was from uh, Prospect Lefferts Garden Council in support. And there was also one in position in opposition and two were undecided. Thank you so much. And Greg, there's a, a person with their hand raised um, that would like to speak, I believe. Do you well, know? Oh, yeah. already spoke. She already spoke. OK, I apologize. Not a problem. And thank you so much. Great. Thank you very much. I want to thank everybody for coming uh, and joining us this morning to participate in this hearing and to inform our, our review of this proposed designation. And I'd like to thank the research department for bringing the proposal. Uh, to the commission. Thank you uh, to Kate Lemus McHale, our director of research, and Mary Ann Principal leading the team on the research efforts here. So we will um, close the hearing today and we will bring this back for a vote in the near future. So, um, Commissioner Chapin, would you make a motion to close the hearing? So moved. And Commissioner Gustafson, would you second that motion? Second. All in favor say aye. Oh. Aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, the hearing is closed um, and we will, as we stated, all of the written materials and testimony have been shared with the commissioners and we'll continue to review those as the research department continues their research and we'll hopefully see everyone back in the near future. And we'll now move to the preservation department agenda and I'll turn it over to Corey Scott Harala, our director of preservation to take us through the public meeting and public hearing items. Okay, thanks Sarah and good morning everyone. Start today's preservation department agenda with public meeting item number one. It's LPC 22-02413, an application for a certificate of appropriateness in the borough of Manhattan, block 1166, lots 13 and 14. 231 and 233 West 74th Street in the West End Collegiate Historic District Extension. This is a pair of Queen Anne style row houses designed by William J. Merritt and built in 1885 to 86. Uh, and the application is to reconstruct the front facades. This was last presented at the public hearing of October 11th, 2022. That was last week uh, and no action was taken at that time. Uh, the staff will be doing a recap of the presentation from last week, but the applicant is available should there be any questions. Okay, and just to be clear, there was, there was no action taken in part because we had no quorum present. Um, staff will summarize the discussion when they present it. Yes, good morning, commissioners, Brian Blazak, preservation staff. Uh, so yes, the subject property is 231-233 West 74th Street, and the application is to reconstruct the deteriorated front facades of two adjoining row houses. The two uh, facades exhibit severe settlement and displacement affecting the entire thickness of the masonry walls. I'll show some representative slides of these conditions and give a quick recap of the proceedings from last week's hearing on October 11th. So these slides show severe settlement damage at both the outer and inner withes of brick are affected. And these slides um, show a string test, um, which show over three inches of settlement between the east and west ends of the building. These slides here show displacement both of the brick 
and at the lintels, as well as missing pieces of terracotta. And the building has been surveyed and fully documented to include floor heights, window and door opening sizes and locations, and brick coursing to ensure accurate reconstruction. The vast majority of historic materials will be salvaged for rebuilding, including brick stone, terracotta tile, and the metal cornice. They will be cataloged and stored in a secure watertight location, and any new materials needed will be reviewed in consultation with staff to match the historic condition. So last week at the conclusion of the presentation and following commissioner discussion, there was a consensus, <clears throat> excuse me, there was a consensus to approve the application. However, no action was taken at that time due to a lack of quorum. The architect is here if you have any questions. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Brian. Commissioners, do we have any questions? All right, um, as Brian said, um, the facade was is very deteriorated and the plan is to salvage and catalog, safely store, catalog and reuse uh, much of the material um, with the exception of the roofing material, which is covered in tar and they're proposing to replace. Um, and uh, we had a, a, a very good discussion about the condition here and the uh, alternatives, which didn't really seem to be um, feasible to even to save some pieces intact so much that the rest of it would have to be reconstructed. So I, Commissioner Devonshire, if you're um, able, I would, would you like to summarize some of your thoughts last time? Well, um, it's been a week and I don't remember what I had for breakfast this morning. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, again, as I said last week, I think the, the approach to this project is, is excellent. They're doing everything right. They're taking every effort to salvage original material. Um, they're, you know, as long as as the staff is uh, is aware of how they're storing it, and hopefully someplace safe where it doesn't get uh, taken away and resold by a salvage uh, vulture. Um, the the only other thing that that I think I might have mentioned was the fact that they're talking about using new belt and brick for replacements. And I think it might be more appropriate for them to look at brick salvage companies and, and find some, some pressed brick at salvage companies because it's gonna be a, a much closer match and the, the um, absorbency of the bricks will be the same as the originals. So uh, I am totally in favor of this one. Okay, great, thank you very much. Commissioner. Commissioner Lutfi, you also were present, I think, and supported this in our discussion. Yeah, and <clears throat> I really feel as though Michael has said it all, and uh, who am I to disagree? And, but of course, I do agree. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I can approve this. Okay, thanks. And Commissioner Chapin, you also were present and supported it last time. Do you want to summarize some of your thoughts? <laughs> Uh, yes, I think it's evident from the presentation that this uh, building uh, for many years and, and right now needs immediate attention. And uh, I think with the uh, suggestions that Commissioner Devonshire has made uh, that we really just need to move forward and allow them to restore this as soon as possible for the safety of the building. Okay, great. Thank you. All right, Commissioner Chen, was there, would you like to add anything? No, I'm, I'm in agreement with the rest of the commissioners. Okay. Thank you. Great, thank you. And Vice Chair Bland? Um, I'm sorry, I missed this last week. Um, these are the sorts of things that we don't see all that often. I guess that's a good thing. Uh, but um, it certainly puts a lot of additional pressure, I think, on the detailing in a, in a highly detailed manner 
uh, on our staff, which I know is up to the challenge, of course, but um, it does do that. And um, I think um, as has been said, uh, this is a, a, a wonderful project to rescue what is uh, an extraordinary little, little uh, historic moment between two <laughs> bigger neighbors that are, I guess, not so historic. But anyway, it's a nice, nice project, and I'm sure it'll be executed well. Okay, thank you. And Commissioner Gustafson. Yeah, I I, I agree with my uh, fellow commissioners. I it's it's. Um, it's really kind of a, a, exciting to hear an applicant um, uh, arguing in favor of uh, putting in a lot of work into a structure that um, has some is in some form of failure, rather than uh, arguing that we should conclude that it um, that the building should be raised. Um, so um, I, I am very supportive. Okay, thank you very much, Commissioner Shimir Varan. Yes, I agree with everything that's been said. Very appropriate. Okay. All right, great, thank you all. So I think we do have a consensus to approve and a quorum today. And so Commissioner Devonshire, would you make the motion? And I think we'll just also say that they, um, at the end, recommend that they continue to explore opportunities for salvage brick um, and to, of course, work closely with the staff on the details. Uh, with pleasure, thank you, Sarah. Um, in the matter of 231-233 West 74th Street in the West End Collegiate Historic District Extension, an application to construct the front facades, I recommend approval, finding that the reconstruction of the West 74th Street facades is warranted due to their deteriorated condition, that the historic facade will be thoroughly documented with fully dimensioned drawings and photographs prior to hand deconstruction. <laughs> That's amazing. That the reconstructed brick facades will be rebuilt to match their existing design, dimensions, details, and placement utilizing three wide masonry construction. That the maximum amount of historic material feasible, including brick, limestone, and decorative terracotta, will be salvaged and stored in a secure, weathertight location and will be reused in the reconstruction of the facades. That no expansion joints, metal relieving angles, or plastic weed tubes will be incorporated as part of the reconstruction work, and the brick joints will be as narrow as possible to match the historic, so that the historic detailing and appearance of the building is maintained. That the work will support the long-term preservation of the buildings, will not detract from the special architectural his, architectural and historic character of the West End Collegiate historic district extension and the applicant will work with staff to explore means of uh, acquiring salvaged historic brick to match the existing press brick. Great. Thank you. And Commissioner Lutfi, would you second that motion? Second. All right, Mark, will you call the vote? Chair Carroll? Aye. Commissioner Bland? Aye. Commissioner Shamir Barron? Aye. Commissioner Chapin? Aye. Commissioner Chen? Aye. Commissioner Devonshire? Aye. Commissioner Gustafson? Aye. Commissioner Lutfi? Aye. With eight in favor and none opposed, the motion passes. That's great. So that's approved. And please continue to work with the staff as you develop the execution details and um, explore the brick. And we'll now move to the next public meeting item. The next item is public meeting item number two, LPC 22-12085, an application for certificate of appropriateness in the borough of Manhattan, block 1378, lot 15, 714 Madison Avenue in the Upper East Side Historic District Extension. This is an Italianate neo grec style row house designed by Gage Ensley and built in 1874 with a storefront addition built in 1926. The application is to install uh, signage, awnings, and light fixtures. And, and I'll note, as I did last week, that uh, it's actually limited to the signs on the awnings at this point. Other items were uh, adjusted to qualify for staff level review. Uh, this was la presented last week at the public hearing of October 11th, 2022. No action was taken at that time. And again, there was not a quorum when it was presented. Uh, the staff will show the revisions uh, to the proposal. Good morning, Commissioners. Michelle Shabrami of the Preservation Staff. The application before you at 714 Madison Avenue, which is located between East 63rd Street and East 64th Streets, is in the Upper East Side Historic District and originally came forward, as Corey said last week, um, October 11th. Um, the proposal was to install awnings 
um, on windows featuring signage on the skirts at the second and third floor windows um, at the commercial extension. Awnings are also proposed for the fourth and fifth floors without signage, which can be reviewed at the staff level. The proposed work does not comply with staff level rules because of the signage on the awnings at the second and third floors. Um, so this is the current proposal, which is the same as the last version, except that the last version also had signage on the side awnings. Um, the proposal as it was originally calendared also included up lights at the facade, halo lit signage at the existing marquee. And the commission staff confirmed that the up lights and non-illuminated signage at the marquee can be reviewed at staff level. So only the awnings are now before you for your review. At the hearing, there was not a quorum, but the commissioners present expressed a consensus of support for installing the awnings with less signage. <clears throat> Some of the commissioners specifically typically suggested that the signage only be installed at the center awnings at both floors. The applicants have revised their proposal to have signage only on awning skirts in the center bays of the second and third floors, and the architect and tenant are here if there are any questions. Great, thank you, Michelle. So this, as Michelle said, this was an application for the awnings at the second and third floor of the storefront projection. And the aspect of those awnings that didn't meet the rules was the signage and they were proposing on signage on the skirt of all six awnings at the two floors. And uh, we asked them to reduce the amount of signage and uh, some specifically mentioned limiting it to the center awnings, which the applicants have done. So are there any questions for this one? Okay, all right, thanks. So I think we can begin the discussion. <clears throat> Commissioner Chapin, you were present. Uh, again, we didn't have a quorum, but we did have a consensus of support to move in this direction. <clears throat> and I think Commissioner Chapin, you had specifically talked about limiting it to the center awnings. Uh, yes, I did, Sarah, and uh, I can approve this uh, with the revisions that they have made. Okay, thank you. And Commissioner Lutfi, you were present for this one also, and I think also uh, felt the reduction in signage would be a good move in order to gain your support. And do you think the changes today have gotten there for you? Yeah, I, thank, I want to thank the applicant for making the changes. It's actually improved um, the, the project and the whole look and feel of the, of the facade of the building. And I think it's actually much more elegant, more in keeping with the brand. So I can approve this. Okay, great, thank you. And Commissioner Devonshire, you also were present last week for this item. I think they've made reasonable changes. I can approve it. Okay, thanks. Thanks very much. Okay, and Commissioner Chen, do you have any thoughts on this? Uh, the same here. I uh, know no, uh, this is appropriate. Okay, Vice Chair Bland. I would agree. Uh, very nicely done and a, a, a nice change based on comments from the commissioners last week. Great, thank you. Commissioner Gustafson? Sometimes less is actually more. Um, <laughs> and uh, I think this is appropriate. Great, thank you. And Commissioner Shamir Barron? I also think it's appropriate. Okay, great. So I think we have a consensus to approve. Commissioner Chapin, would you make the motion? Uh, yes, thank you. In the matter of the Certificate of Appropriateness for Old Manhattan, LPC 22-12085, 714 Madison Avenue, Upper East Side Historic District Extension. An Italianate neo, neo brick style uh, row house designed by Gay Ginsley and built in 1874 with the storefront addition built in 1926. Application is to install signage, awnings, and light fixtures. I note that the building's style, scale, materials, and details are among the features that contribute to the special architectural and historic character of the Upper East Side Historic District. I recommend approval, finding the word, that the work will not eliminate or damage any significant architectural features, that the awnings will be typical in terms of placement, size, slope, material, and finish, that the limited amount of signage at the awning skirts at this commercial extension will be compatible with the character of the extension and this section of Madison Avenue, and that the work will not detract from the historic architectural character of the building or historic district. Thank you. And Commissioner Shamir Barron, would you second that motion? Second. All right, Mark, will you call the vote? Chair Carroll? Aye. Commissioner Bland? Aye. Commissioner Shamir Barron? Aye. 
Commissioner Chapin. Aye. Commissioner Chen. Aye. Commissioner Devonshire. Aye. Commissioner Gustafson. Aye. Commissioner Lutfi. Aye. With eight in favor and none opposed, the motion passes. Great, so that's approved. Thank you very much. And we'll now move to our public hearing agenda. Thank you. Okay, we'll start with public hearing item number one, LPC 22-08622, an application for a certificate of appropriateness in the borough of Brooklyn, block 1095, lot 65, 611 11th Street in the Park Slope Historic District. This is a neo grec style row house built in 1891, and the application is to construct a rear yard addition and deck. Hey, commissioners, the applicants have entered the hearing. Elizabeth, you now have control of the presentation. You can just um, advance the slides using your arrow keys or your mouse, whichever works best for you. Um, please state your name for the record and you may begin. Good morning. My name is Elizabeth Mallets and I'm the architect for 611 11th Street in the Park Slope Historic District in Brooklyn. So this shows the, the front facade of the building. It's a three-story brownstone townhouse in the middle of the block. And our scope of work is to construct a new rear house extension to replace the existing one-story house extension and also a new rear deck at the parlor level. This slide shows the historic district map and our property is located on the middle of the block on 11th Street. This is a view of the existing rear facade of the building, which is painted brick. There's an existing wood deck and an existing one-story house extension built out of CMU, used primarily as a shed. So in our proposal, we'll demolish the existing one-story building and construct a slightly larger version, also one-story, using CMU with face brick and a new steel deck structure. This is a, a wider view showing the, our property and then the two adjacent properties. And here's the existing and proposed plan showing the, the demolition of the existing one-story building and construction of the new, slightly larger. This is the existing and proposed at the parlor level. So removal of existing deck and construction of a new deck. Here's uh, an elevation drawing of the proposed rear facade with the two adjacent properties shown as well. Here is the, uh, again, the elaboration of the rear facade showing also the side of the proposed house extension and a section of the deck. Finishes will be um, a paint finish on the brick and the deck will be black. None of the work will be visible from any public area or thoroughfare. This is showing two sections. And this is the block plan showing our property in the middle of the block. Um, the other buildings are either three or four stories for the color code. And there are many existing house extensions um, in either one or two story primarily and different uh, dimensions. This is just an aerial view showing again our property mid block and our area of work is not visible. Thank you. Thank you very much. Commissioners, do we have any questions? All right, I don't see any questions. So let's see if we have public testimony. If you're in the meeting and would like to testify on this item, please raise your virtual hand so we can identify you. And I will turn it over to Gregory Kala to take us through any testimony. Thank you, Chair Carroll. Uh, we did not receive any signups before the hearing or meeting. Uh, I'm waiting to see if any hands raise no. Uh, so there are no speakers for this, uh, but Community Board 6 in Brooklyn did recommend approval. Okay, thank you. All right, so commissioners, if we don't have any final questions 
for the applicant, I'm going to go ahead and send you requests to unmute so that we can move to our discussion. So uh, Commissioner Lutfi, would you make a motion to close the hearing? So moved. And Commissioner Bland, would you second that motion? Second. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, the hearing is closed and we'll begin our discussion. And so this is a proposal for a one-story addition uh, with a deck on top of it. And it is here before us because um, it technically uh, meets almost all of the criteria of the rule that allows the staff to approve rear yard additions, except for the fact that there, the number of, there are not an, more than 50% of the houses do not have a, an addition that projects as deeply, which is one of the criteria or, or one of the requirements of, for a staff level permit. However, the applicant has shown that this is a block with a varied additions of varied heights and depths. And on uh, this side of the block on either side of it, there are larger and deeper additions. And, um, and the one story addition I think is, quite modest. Commissioner Chen, would you like to start on this one? Yeah, I, I have no problem with it. I think this is appropriate. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Bland? Uh, same thing. I think this is uh, very reasonable. All right, Commissioner Lutfi? Commissioner Lutfi? You're on mute. Yeah, sorry. Um, yeah, this is very modest and in keeping with uh, what uh, the inside of the uh, donut looks like uh, in the block, the additional incursion is minimal. Thank you. Commissioner Gustafson. Uh, the, the, the free space in rear yard addition bingo. Um, this is respectful. There's no visibility. There's only a slight increase in the projection in the yard, and it's uh, and it's consistent with most of the other rear yard additions. This is fine. Commissioner Shamir Barron. Yes, modest and appropriate. Commissioner Chapin. Modest, appropriate, approvable as presented. Okay, thank you. All right, so I think we all agree. Commissioner Chen, would you read the motion? Yeah. In a matter of LPC-22-08622, uh, uh, 611 11th Street, Park Slope Historic District, the application is construct a rear addition and deck, uh, noting the building style, scale style, materials, and details among the features that contribute to the special architectural and historic character of the Park Slope Historic District. I recommend approval, finding that the replacement of the existing modern partial width one-story rear addition with a partial width one-story addition with, and the deck will not eliminate or damage any significant architectural features or be visible from a public thoroughfare. That the proposed addition will not rise to the full height of the house and the addition and deck will only occupy a small portion of the rear yard, thereby helping to retain the yeah. finding aspects of the building's original scale and missing and massing and not significantly diminish uh, the central green space that the proposed addition will be consistent with other rear yard additions with the block in terms of the uh, height and overall footprint and will only significant uh, slightly increase the projection onto the central yard that the proposed addition will feature a materials palette and pre predominance of solid solidity and and peers which are consistent uh, with secondary uh, facades at the rear of row houses of this style and age that the proposed work will not detract from the special architectural and historic character of the building or the district thank you and commissioner chapin would you second that motion second mark will you call the vote chair carroll aye commissioner bland aye Commissioner Shamir Barron. Aye. Commissioner Chapin. Aye. Commissioner Chen. Aye. Commissioner Devonshire. Aye. Commissioner Gustafson. Aye. Commissioner Lutte. Aye. With eight in favor and none opposed, the motion passes. That's approved. Thank you. And we'll move to the next item. The next item is public hearing item number two, LPC 22-09602. 
an application for a certificate of appropriateness in the borough of Manhattan, block 484, lot 7501, 72 Mercer Street, AKA 501 Broadway in the Soho Cast Iron Historic District. This is a mixed use residential and commercial building designed by TRA Studio and built in 2003. The application is to legalize alterations to the facade without LPC permits. Okay, commissioners, the applicants have entered the hearing. Halak, you now have control of the presentation. If you just click on your screen, you can advance the slides using your arrow keys or your mouse. Uh, please state your name for the record and you may begin. Um, my name is Palak Shah and I'm the architect for the building. I will be presenting a proposal to remove the exterior perforated panels from Broad Street Facade 72 Mercer and 501 Broadway. Okay. 72 Mercer and 501 Broadway is a new mixed use building with retails on the ground floor and loft apartments above. The building spans the entire lot between Broadway and Mercer streets. Construction was completed in 2003 by TRA Studio. This is a 1960 Bromley map of the block context showing the footprints of the loft buildings. The original building, which was destroyed by fire in the 1960s, was designed in the 1860s in the early days of the cast iron renaissance emerging along the booming Broadway strip. In this period, the buildings on Broadway are an early example of the new type of retail and manufacturing buildings being constructed classically designed with monumental facades. The Mercer Street facade has few recesses, details, and shallow cornices, which highlight the utilitarian and gritty nature of the secondary facade of the building. Mercer facade is a brick and metal panel veneers facade with aesthetic perforated window panels. The Broadway facade has a limestone and metal panel veneer facade with aesthetic perforated window panels. A proposal is to remove the aesthetic perforated window panels, the cladding, from both the street facades. Both the facades make subtle references to the urban context. The geometry of the both facades fits with the pattern of the surroundings, but at the same time, the new building responds to the need to stand out as a contemporary statement. As seen in the surrounding cast and loft buildings, very few prefabricated elements are utilized in order to create two similar but different facades. We observed that no building in the street context have panels or panel system. All are pure window openings without any obstructions. Here is a solid white diagram study for Mercer Street. A proposed panel removal does not affect the historic fabric of the district, but the palette resonates the existing building and streetscape. This is a detailed solid white study of the window proportions within the context of the neighboring buildings. The proposed new proportion of the windows at both the facades, which will be longer and less square window openings, in our opinion, will be more fitting for the district. A similar solid white study was done for the Broadway facade. The block has varied context of stone buildings and a solid interaction between solids and voids as well as transparency and opacity without any window panel obstructions. It is also a blend of a broad range of building types and ages, which has existed historically and relatively new and still fit in while maintaining the character and integrity of the historic district. Hence our proposal to remove the panels will not affect the character or context of the block for both the buildings, Broadway and Mercer. Longer and less square window openings, but in fact, will blend in more with the proportions of the neighboring buildings on the block. These panels were removed when the building underwent facade repairs. That is when the residents realized how much light was obstructed due to the panels. The upper photos are the before photos and the lower photos are the after. These residential units are loft spaces and as such have no exposures on the side of the unit. All the sunlight comes in either from the front windows or the back windows facing the courtyard. The aesthetic panels substantially reduce the available area of unobstructed light to pass through. The reduction of ambient light also increases the need for electric powered interior lights, which increases the overall energy consumption of the building. Photos on this slide are for comparative basis to exhibit the difference with panels and without panels, 
with respect to the amount of unobstructed daylight entering the units. These acidic panels also retain moisture during winter and form ice, which then falls to the sidewalk. Additionally, since these panels retain moisture, they corrode faster and thus does not serve the purpose of being aesthetic. We did a district-wide study of all the buildings in the Soho Casta and Historic District, which have a similar solid void ratios configuration to 72 Mercer and 501 Broadway. This study included both historic and newly constructed buildings. We observed that these examples of similar context buildings in the district did not have any panel system. These similar context buildings exhibit a balance of solid void transpar transparency and opacity with unobstructed window openings. In conclusion, we observed that the buildings similar to 72 Mercer and 501 Broadway's configuration and framework did not have panel obstruction to the windows and yet maintained the historic integrity of the block as well as the district context. These are the comparative drawings for Mercer and Broadway streets, highlighting the changes in the existing and proposed elevations. The perforated panels serve only aesthetic purpose. Design aesthetic is subjective. However, any aesthetic should provide some assimilation into the surrounding context. It is for all these reasons discussed, we propose the removal of the perforated panels at the windows on both Mercer and Broadway streets. Thank you. Great, thank you very much. Do we have any questions, commissioners? Okay, let's see if we have any public testimony. If you're in the meeting and would like to testify on this item, please raise your virtual hand so we can identify you. And I will turn it over to Gregory Kala to take us through any testimony. Thank you, Chair Carol. Uh, we did not receive any signups beforehand and I am not seeing any hands raised in the Zoom. But I would like to note that Manhattan Community Board 2 did recommend approval unanimously. Okay, thank you very much. All right, so um, commissioners, if there are no final questions, I think I will head us toward a discussion. So look for my request to unmute so we can close the hearing. All right, and Commissioner Gustafson, would you make a motion to close the hearing? So moved. And Commissioner Shamir Barron, would you second that motion? Second. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, the hearing is closed and we'll begin our discussion. This is a commission approved building that was constructed in 2003. And at the time, the design that was proposed to us um, included these perforated metal spandrels um, at the base of the windows. And um, as the applicant stated, while the, the building was doing work, they removed them and would like to keep them, uh, to keep them, to remove them permanently from the facade and not reinstall them. And they've made a case that the facade proportions, articulation, and detail, level of detail is uh, comparable to historic and other commission approved buildings in the district. So, Commissioner Lutfi, would you like to start this one? Sure. Um... You know, I, of course, they shouldn't have done the removal without our approval. That goes uh, almost without saying, but I have to say, I think it's an improvement. Um, and I do think uh, there's more consistency in the facade. And I also agree it blends a little more with the window articulation uh, on the street. So I could approve this. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Gustafson. Yeah, I, I really have no issues with the legalization part of it. Uh, you know, they re they removed it in routine maintenance and and uh, they came to us. So I'm not uh, um, concerned about that. Um, I will admit that I when I was reviewing the materials, uh, I was struggling with trying to identify exactly what the change was. Um, and um, and and so I do appreciate the presentation was um, absolutely clear. And, and that was terrific. Um, I, I don't have. Uh, any issue whatsoever with the removal of these panels. I think that uh, um, uh, there's uh, uh, it's the, the building stands on its own without them. Okay, great. Thank you. Commissioner Shamir Barron. I agree. I think um, it's appropriate to uh, f for us to approve 
th these with the removal of these panels, even though I think they were interesting and I understand why we approved them in the first place, but I think this is appropriate. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Chapin? Yeah, I think it was an originally an interesting architectural conceit, but I, I think it actually uh, fits in better uh, with the streetscape uh, as uh, presented and I can approve it. Commissioner Devonshire. Yeah, I, I think it's an, an improvement actually and appropriate. Thank you, and Commissioner Chen? Yeah, I agree with all the comments, uh, especially Commissioner Gustafson. Thank you, and Vice Chair Bland. Um, I, I like those um, panels, uh, but I think the building stands well enough alone without them. Uh, so I can say that this is an appropriate change. <clears throat> okay, thank you. All right, so I think we are in agreement and um, Commissioner Leffy, would you make the motion? Sure. Uh, in the matter of docket 22-09602, uh, 72 Mercer Street, AKA 501 Broadway, the Soho Kassarn Historic District, a mixed use residential and commercial building designed by TRA Studio and built in 2003. The application is to legalize the alterations to the facades without Landmarks Preservation Commission permits. I note that the building was built in 2003 pursuant, pursuant to a certificate of appropriateness I recommend approval finding that the removal of the perforated panels at this modern building did not eliminate or damage any significant architectural features, that the permanent removal of all of the perforated panels on the facades maintains the uniformity of the facades designs without altering their overall ca character, that without the panels, the facades continue to feature a solid to void ratio, typically found at historic cast iron buildings within the historic district and level of articulation, which is evocative of the ornamentation historically found at such buildings, that the lower portions of the windows exposed by the removal of the panels are compatible with the overall fenestration pattern and that the removal of the panels does not detract from the historic character of the streetscape or historic district. Thank you. And Commissioner Gustafson, would you second that motion? Second. Mark, will you call the vote? Chair Carroll? Aye. Commissioner Bland? Aye. Commissioner Shamir Barron? Aye. Commissioner Chapin? Aye. Commissioner Chen? Aye. Commissioner Davinger? Aye. Commissioner Gustafson? Aye. Commissioner Lutte? Aye. With eight in favor, none opposed, the motion passes. That's approved, thank you. And we'll move to the next item. Next item is public hearing item number three, LPC 23-00996, an application for a certificate of appropriateness in the borough of Manhattan, block 539, lot 39, 163 Bleecker Street in the South Village Historic District. This is a factory building designed by Charles E. Haddon and built in 1892 uh, and also altered in 1993. The application is to enlarge and redesign the building. Hey, commissioners, the applicants have entered the hearing. Uh, George and Joe, you now have control of the presentation. You just need to click on your screen. Great, and you can advance the slides using your arrow keys or your mouse. Please state your name for the record and you may begin. Hi, good morning. My name is Joe Nakamalas. Um, I am the uh, Senior Associate Director of Design at Mojo Streamer Associates, where the architect does projects. I'm joined by George Luis Camella. He's a Senior Project Manager and Architect on our team running the projects. And I believe we're also joined on the call today by one of the representatives of the owner for the project, Ofra Cohen, and our filing representative, Alvaro Bolanos from the Praxis Workshop. Um, I want to thank everybody quickly for your time and your consideration today. Um, what, what we're looking at presenting to you today is the proposed renovation and redesign of the existing building at 163 Bleecker Street in the South Village Historic District. Um, the building is being proposed to be repurposed for new use as a uh, music venue. Um, and as you can see here in this, in this first slide, uh, here's an interesting picture of the building. I want to give you a, a quick kind of brief high level overview of what we're doing and, and what was sort of driving a lot of our design intent. And then George is going to take over and give you a much more detailed walkthrough of the history of the site and the location and how we arrived at the design that we have. Um, but, but the big picture here is that we, we have this existing two-story building 
Um, it suffered a fire in 2020 and has since been partially restored, but has not been again occupied. Um, the building itself has little to no historic architectural value. It's been modified and altered many times over recent decades, and any semblance of its original architecture has long since been lost. Uh, and I believe in the designation report, it's classified as the building of no style. Um, so we're, we're looking to turn this building into a new concert venue with associated offices on the second floor. Um, our owners for this project are actually already invested in this neighborhood. They own two other concert venues in this district. They understand the culture, they understand the people, they understand the neighborhood, and they, as well as we, have a great appreciation for you know, the character and the diversity um, and, and all of the, the nuance of color that makes this, this district and this neighborhood what it is. Um, but but what, what, what's, I think, particularly of interest in this project, and, and George will start to go into detail, but you can see it from these pictures, is the scale of this building. Because you know, not only does it not have any particular architectural historic value to its current facade, the building has a, a unique scale as it relates to its context. Um, it's obviously a, a short building of two stories uh, sandwiched by two much larger buildings on the sides. Um, and in our early design, we saw this as a really great opportunity to not only improve the building and create a beautiful new concert venue to serve the community here, but to have the architecture help treat this almost as an infill design element that could better integrate it horizontally and vertically and materially with its surroundings. Um, you know, there's seemingly a lack of alignments with this building and it just feels like it's not appropriated into the context here. So as we walk into the design, you'll notice there's special focus in our presentation and how the architecture, how the proportions and how the massing not only are, are you know, derivative of important elements found throughout the neighborhood, but also how it directly responds to the two elements on either side and helps just to sort of, you know, stitch the fabric of this part of the block back together a little bit. So with that, I'll hand it over to George. He'll give you some of the more detailed elements of walking through this. So just to touch on a couple of points that Joe made, um, this is a building originally built in 1892. The architect was Charles E. Haddon. The designation report does list this as a no-style factory building. Uh, it underwent three alterations, one in 1931, 1980, and 1993. Mostly those alterations were stripping away its original uh, facade design. And some of the additions were, as you see here, is a faux partial pagoda, uh, which has really no historical connection to the South Village Historic District. Um, this is a, an image of the block in its current state at the bottom, looking east on the right-hand side and looking west on the left-hand side. Unfortunately, it's covered mostly by scaffolding, so we were able to find some images of the buildings at 155 through 169 on the internet and add them as part of the presentation. You'll notice that mostly, like in, in the rest of the district, it's made up of ground floor, either single or double story uh, commercial storefront with approximately two to five stories worth of residential on top, with the exception being that at 159 uh, Bleecker, which in our sense and our opinion is a little bit overscaled relative to the block in the district. The next slide here shows the corners at 155 Bleecker and 169 Bleecker, which we weren't able to show on the previous slide because of the scaffolding that's currently in place. And across the street, we have a very historic uh, building, the water, the, sorry, the Mills Hotel at 160 Bleecker, which is now called the Atrium also covered and clad in completely in scaffolding. What we did notice though, walking around the neighborhood and we fell in love with the charm of some of its aspects were uh, things like the dark panelized uh, storefront at 80 West Third Street, Amity Hall. Uh, we were very sensitive to the proportioning and the scale and the double height nature of the facade there. Uh, we noticed that uh, between the, the ground floor entry and the upper portion glass, uh, the gritty glass, was a beautiful signage band, probably about 10 or 12 inches high, most likely 12, with the uh, address of Amity Hall and the name of the, the establishment. We found a similar facade to that, uh, not double story, but at 219 Thompson Street, uh, more affectionately known as a chess worm, also with a dark, a uh, gridded window system with panels uh, surrounded by a masonry um, clad building. Uh, some contemporary examples which we looked at for inspiration and reference was at 179 Sullivan Street, where, where there we found a dark painted steel channel marquee 
And similar to like at 80 West 3rd Street, Amity Hall, it had the lettering uh, embedded between the channel flanges and the steel. And then, um, so that brings us to our design. We really took cues from the facades at 80 West 3rd Street and the Chess Forum and a few other examples of the tops of the buildings at 172 through 176 Bleecker Street, uh, some of the Bohemian additions there, where we did use as a catalyst the, the insertion of a, of a, a dark gridded and panelized uh, window system with a masonry surround. And I'm gonna use my cursor here to point at certain elements. What's unique here at 163 Bleecker Street though, which is unlike the, the, the residential and commercial typology in the neighborhood, is this building will be used solely uh, for commercial purposes as a venue as Joe described. So we do have a, a double story venue like an Amity Hall, but what we have on the second floor are the support offices for the venue. So we decided to take that dark panelized and grid uh, window system and extend it to capture the second floor as part of the overall ensemble of the building. This element here on the left um, represents essentially the egress stair that goes from the second floor all the way down to the, to the street level. And we decided to insert there uh, an aluminum clad a slat system with warm tones that picked up on the brick of the of the neighborhood and also on some of the wooden storefronts. So we're we're looking for ways really to bring the block together, to bring elements of the neighborhood and the district and kind of reclaim some of the historical value of this of this infill. Uh, I don't really think of it as a contemporary infill, though the image of the building might appear to be that. It's really referencing and drawing and inspired by uh, great examples of, of historical examples of the district. What we see here is an opportunity though, to bring the block together uh, right now, because there is this kind of cavity in between the two sides. So we started uh, noticing that there are certain alignments, horizontal alignments that we started to bring through with the building at one, sorry, 159, uh, where the top of the base there does go through our building, the brick bands, translate through where the spandrel panels are. The height of the windows are being brought through. Uh, so in, in essence, there are elements of the adjacent buildings that are being brought through our building and kind of stitching and tying the block and reintegrating the block as best as we could. We use the warm tones again of the wood look um, slats to bring the warm tones of the block through here. But our selection for the brick was more of a neutral palette because of the browns and beiges and the reds and the whites, uh, we thought that if we had a, a kind of neutral palette that we start to bring again and stitch the block back together. You wanna add something? No, I, I just thought I would add to that, um, the comment and you'll see it in one of our coming diagrams that show the flat elevations of the existing post conditions. Um, Cause we studied this a number of different ways. And I will add too, um, we, we've, we, we took this in front of community board too. We received feedback from the community board all of their feedback, we feel that we've integrated into the design through very specific changes we've incorporated. Um, and I think we've adequately responded to the comments they had. We've also had a number of rounds of pre-meetings and, and really collaborative and, and helpful and thoughtful feedback with both Brian and Jared from LPC staff. They've given us a lot of, I think, really strong input on how to um, strengthen the presentation, strengthen the design and, and, and work towards this. And, and we're grateful for their input. And I think all of it has led to a much more thorough design and concept. But just to the note, as George mentioned about the color, we've done multiple studies and multiple iterations of this project. And like we said, because of the uniqueness of this scale, when we studied different color options, it, it always kept feeling as though this building was uh, an accidental appendage to one of its neighbors. If this building was in red brick, it felt like a forgotten component of the building to its left. And if the building was in brown brick, it felt like a, a, a late odd addition to the building to the right. So we really felt it appropriate to let the building have its own expressed identity with this neutral gray tone brick, um, which also I think ties back to some of these other really interesting components of the village that we pulled out. But then by, through the proportioning and the alignment and the horizontality, to stitch it together in a meaningful way while still letting it express its own identity. Uh, just to add, before moving on to the next slide, a couple of minor elements is like at Amity Hall and some of the contemporary examples, we also uh, are inserting a marquee and the lettering of the venue will be on top with an LED illuminated between the channels here in contrasting light uh, lettering 
like those found in other examples throughout the district. So the next slide, sorry. The next slide shows that by zoning, the street wall could be 60 feet. Our proposed height is 37 foot, two inches. It's about a five foot uh, vertical extension from the existing condition. In order to fit the venue though, um, we needed the additional five feet of height. So just pointing that out to everybody. Uh, I'll go quickly through this. The demolition on the lower two levels is really the removal mostly of uh, partitions and some very minor areas to allow for new stairs to be installed in the venue. And the extent, the, the majority of the demolition really occurs on the second and roof because of the fire and the compromise to the structure of the existing building. Uh, this, this is a plan of the seller showing all the support spaces for the venue on the lower level, artist spaces, uh, commercial kitchen, everything separated uh, appropriately to be fire rated. Uh, the venue occurs on the first floor and the mezzanine level. And what we want to point out here, though, is we, we have worked with very closely with an acoustical consultant. They strongly recommended the addition of a second plane of glass to create a vestibule. That vestibule helps to mitigate any sound transmittance through the facade out into the street. Uh, and also uh, the lighting elements of the venue will be contained in the central portion of the plan. We have a compressed zone that I'll show you in a section uh, shortly. So we're using these areas, which are bars on the mezzanine and on the lower level as a kind of compressed ceiling level uh, to, to again, soften the sound uh, transmission and the light transmission out into the street. On the second floor, like we mentioned, it's uh, purely dedicated to the second floor offices, support spaces for the venue. And the roof, uh, we included this plan just so you see that all the mechanical systems are all in the back with the exception of this one unit, but it is moved back far enough so it's not visible from the street. This is the elevation that Joe's talking about. Maybe he'll add a little comment to this, but you can see how the existing conditions really kind of wedge themselves, force themselves into the block. So we were carefully looking, you know, at 80 West 3rd Street and other facades, but even at the storefront facades on the block itself and seeing the breakdown of the scale of the storefront elements and using that scale and that proportioning and bringing it into our storefront so that it would marry the block together and marry the district together. Some of the horizontal readings also help to kind of stitch one side of the block to the other. These are the opportunities that we found. Uh, for our design. This is just an enlarged elevation shown that comparison. Uh, these are the sections that show the double height entry with the vestibule and then the venue being uh, moved towards the back of the, the site with the second floor offices above. These are just some additional supporting sections. Uh, this is a, a detailed wall section. You can see that the marquee, uh, we're proposing to extend it five feet. If there's a reason why it needs to be a little shorter, we can certainly bring it back. But the window grid system is about a two foot grid, carefully proportioned. It's set back about four inches from the face of the masonry. So it is captured within the masonry surround. Uh, we have a cast on coping at the very top. And at the bottom in this next wall section here, we do have a granite base. We had some discussions with the LPC staff about this and uh, we, we decided to make it a little bit higher. We thought it would have a little more presence. And it also is set back from the masonry plane. And the last slide here just shows the simplicity of the materials. The neutral color, uh, warm gray brick, the dark uh, metal uh, for the spandrel panels uh, between the second floor and the ground floor double story venue. And the light cherry colored wood look aluminum uh, slats inserted into the zone of the egress stairs. So I don't know if Joe has any additional comments, but at this point, we are open to uh, questions and testimony. Okay, thank you. Commissioners, do we have any questions? All right, I don't see any questions at this time. So why don't we move to public testimony and we may have questions after that. So if you're in the meeting and would like to testify on this item, please raise your virtual hand so we can identify you and I will turn it over to Gregory Kala to take us through the testimony. Thank you so much, Chair Carroll. Uh, we did receive a few signups ahead of time, so I will be going through that right now. Uh, first will be Anna Markham. 
Uh, so Anna, I will be promoting you to panelists now. So if you can please unmute your line and state your name for public record, you will have three minutes to speak. Thank you. Good morning, commissioners, and thank you for the opportunity to testify. My name is Anna Markham, and I am speaking on behalf of Village Preservation today. The proposed design for 163 Bleecker Street is, in, is inappropriate for the South Village Historic District. We strongly echo Community Board 2's recommendation that the commission deny this application. It is abundantly clear from the existing and proposed street elevations that this design bears no relation to the district's architectural context. The vertical slash the vertical sash windows, the, the vertical slash of windows and entry door, gridded triple height glazed windows, use of false materials such as wood look aluminum, and the choice of dark urban brick have no place in this district. Approval of this proposal in any form would set a harmful precedent. While we are not opposed to contemporary architecture in this district, it should be thoughtfully designed in conversation with the historic architecture of the neighborhood, not contemporary. This is not. Thank you. Thank you for that, Anna. And next up, we will have Lucy Levin from Historic District Council. So Lucy, I will be promoting you to panelists now. So if you could please unmute your line and state your name for public record, you'll have three minutes to speak. Thank you so much. My name is Lucy Levine, speaking on behalf of the Historic Districts Council. HDC believes that a taller redesigned facade in this location is appropriate. We find this particular proposal, however, to be a bit clunky and in need of further design. In particular, we find the pattern of the fenestration of the hierarchy and the proposed window system on the larger opening to be lacking in material and proportional finesse. We would ask LPC to have the applicant study this facade further and hopefully produce something that more clearly reflects the opportunity that this project allows. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much, Lucy. And next up, we will have John Graham from Victorian Society. So John, I will be promoting you to panelists now. So if you could please unmute your line and state your name for the public record, we will have three minutes to speak. Good morning, Commissioners. John Graham for the Victorian Society, New York. In the historic photo, photos, we can see that originally this circa 1892 low-rise commercial building had a harmonious relationship to its neighbors and to the streetscape. These early views show a masonry facade with pleasing proportions, a transparent ground floor storefront extending the full width of the building, and large clear glass windows on the second floor. These were divided into two well-proportioned bays. The masonry cladding, wide storefront, and second floor windows, painted trim, and most importantly, the open relationship to the street remain essentially intact today, but with an unfortunate loss of some details. The proposed remake of 163 Bleecker Street changes this, adding a tall, dark, panelized window and door system to this structure. This would be set into a gray brick surround with a light entry door and vertical elements made of a material we don't know, identified as wood look aluminum cladding manufactured by Lux Luxiclad. This appears to be faux wood grain printed on sheet aluminum. We're skeptical. The applicant states that this alteration integrates the existing structure back into the historic fabric found in the district. We strongly disagree with the proposed design that the proposed design achieves this goal in any way, including in style, proportions, materials, or finishes. We also note that the photographs show nearby examples of dark painted gridded storefronts are not convincing as grounds to insert a giant window wall here. Other than the large gridded window on the immediately adjacent building, a building for which the district was not designated, the photographs include, as nearby examples of dark painted gridded storefronts, have a very different character. The proposed design also seems to rely on modular panelized brick, which will appear quite different from the hand-laid brick used in nearby historic structures. 
we recommend that the applicant rework this design to refine the proportions and details and to select materials which are more typical of those found in this historic district. Thank you, commissioners. Thank you, John. And I believe that is all for uh, public hearing testimony. Uh, I will like to note for the record that Manhattan Community Board 2 does recommend denial for this for missing vital details of the district's streetscape and identity and recommends a new design be brought to the board that is more harmonious. Great, thank you very much. All right, I'd like to turn back to the applicants and ask if you'd like to respond to the testimony. Um, yeah, no, certainly I will. I mean, I think it, it, it's certainly warranting plenty of conversation, um, and, and we can have that conversation. Um, a, few, a few of the very specific comments that we could easily address. I think there are elements of materiality that there are certainly options and, and opportunities to change or modify. For example, the conversation about the woodwork aluminum. Um, George explained our thought process for why we wanted to integrate that color and that tone. Um, and, and I think there's good reasoning for it. The fact that it is an aluminum, it was strictly selected based on the, the durability and, and the, the fact that it would be something that would not fade or decay or rot. But elements like that, I think we're happy to discuss other options for and um, materiality and, and, and what the componentry really could be. Um, and like I said, we, we've had a really good relationship thus far working with Brian and Jared. Um, they've given us good input. We've talked about this element in a couple of different ways. So, we could certainly explore different materiality, different options for some of those components. Um, but again, I think on a big picture, a lot of our inspiration is drawn not only from certain very specific historic details that you'll see in the village, but a lot of the more dynamic character that's been injected in the village over the decades, especially in the Beatnik and the Bohemian periods and the, the rediscovery of the village in the 40s and 50s and 60s and the influence of music and, and the cultural importance of uh, music and some really important musical venues had on the neighborhood. So a lot of this building was, was drawn, again, to kind of celebrate some of that character and some of that architecture not specifically for this to be a historic building to, I think we, we find it very harmonious in terms of scale and proportion. Um, yeah, we, we agree with, I think the designation report that states that the existing building um, really does not have any historic value that that's worth saving or worth recreating. Um, and so again, we thought this is a great opportunity to present the building that has some neutral characteristics that are appropriate due to its scale, um, but still has a lot of other, you know, I think connecting fibers and, and, and uh, fabric back into its surroundings. So, but we're happy to get the commissioner's input and talk through the best way to proceed with, um, you know, possible small modifications that, that could help. <laughs> okay, thank mm -hmm. you. Um, commissioners, do we have any other questions? All right, I just had one question. You know, I think one thing that defines the South Village Historic District or that is maybe different about it than say the Greenwich Village Historic District where you have some streets of very consistent typologies and consistent details in long rows of row houses. Um, you know, this is a, as you pointed out, a very eclectic, more eclectic district and a, a very eclectic, eclectic streetscape. However, one of the things that I think for me sort of characterizes the South Village District is the sort of history of multiple uses within a building, sort of multi-use buildings, mixed-use buildings, and often with sort of commercial at the ground floor and residential on upper floors, which resulted in um, sort of a different design and or scale or fenestration pattern between the ground floor and the upper floors. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, I recognize that your venue is on these two floors. And I think you probably want to have a uniform appearance to, to sort of identify that the venue is in this spot. But can you speak a little bit to your thoughts about these sort of triple height openings and the vertical nature of them in this streetscape. If maybe if you go to the street elevation, you can sort of see the scale sure. of the portions of the rest of the street. Oh, yeah. yeah, this one. Yeah, that helps. I mean, uh, a lot of it again came back in our early design studies and through the development to the proportionality of this building. And obviously it's unique scale as it relates to the context. Um, and I would say even this elevation, the pictures don't even do it justice. The building to the right here is staggeringly larger than, than our building. And um, in a way that you can see it in this image, I think the portions on the top by having that very clear definition of lower and upper level 
serve only to make the building feel, uh, we, we feel more out of place, more kind of swashed by its surroundings and, and less, um, less able to show any prominence on its own. So while our goal wasn't to make the building look and feel as tall as it is, um, we did find that by responding, allowing the facade to respond a little bit to the program within and to connect some of those elements in, in a functionally appropriate way, um, it, it had us, it, it, that was leading us towards this building that was expressing itself a little bit more in a vertical dimension. And I think it really does go a long way in helping this building not feel like, like an out of place forgotten small building that, that's being kind of squeezed out by its very, very small neighbors. So there's definitely an element there that we focused on. But again, I, I call back to, because I think it's very valuable, the, the horizontal alignment that we're trying to reintroduce here, I think does, it goes a long way to sort of re-stitch this building back into that fabric and connect some of these lines across. Um, but I, again, standing there, like what I'll say is the pictures because of the scaffolding and a lot of the street scenes, it is hard to appreciate it. Um, I mean, you're looking up at this big building with this big flat brown brick wall to the right and it's, it's staggering. It's really overpowering. So we're trying to um, work around that as best we can. Okay, all right. Uh, commissioners, if there are no final questions, let's move to our discussion. And I'm starting to send you all requests to unmute. All right. And uh, Commissioner Chen, would you make a motion to close the hearing? So moved. Thank you. And Commissioner Lutfi, would you second that motion? Oops, you just muted. Second. <laughs> all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, the hearing is closed and we'll now begin our discussion um, to replace this building, which um, is identified as no style in the uh, designation report um, and is not a building for which the district was designated with a new uh, taller uh, building and facade with these sort of vertical uh, triple height openings and a gray brick. So okay. we'll begin our discussion. Vice Chair Bland, would you like to start this one? I had a hunch you might call on me. Um, thank you. Um, so much to think about for such a small building. But um, um, I think a lot of what I heard from the applicants was very interesting uh, in terms of their analysis of um, the district and um, the history of architecture and other things in the district, uh, some of which are not um, so visual. So I found that interesting, uh, but I still think that the building that they've come up with um, is not an appropriate building um, for the district at this point. Um, um, and I think, uh, Sarah, you have, put your finger on some of the problems with regard to um, a, a, a better defined, let's call it, because they have sort of defined, but a better defined uh, um, street level presence with an upper level um, above that that is somehow differentiated. And I think the, the problem starts with maybe that, that the upper level is, um, you know, in both cases, the doors and the windows are um, interesting. I mean, if this were in Gowanus or uh, Williamsburg or some other place, it might well uh, be a very fitting building. But I think right here, it's not yet. Um, but I, it's hard, hard for me to pick it apart and, and I don't want to, and I almost never do that in any event. Uh, but I su just suggest that, um, Perhaps if they um, took cues from the idea that um, a, a better, a more definitively expressed lower level, street level, uh, differentiated from the upper level windows, um, that, that might be a beginning. And I think the materials um, should definitely be restudied. Um, I think, um, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure that, you know, this is a, 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 a tiny little building wedged in between much build, bigger buildings. I think it can be quite a different expression and I hope, I think they will continue to, to, to express this in a very contemporary manner. And I think that's the appropriate approach. 
but I, I just think it needs to have rearrangement of, of the elements and a reconsideration of the materials. Perhaps not all the materials. I'm not sure that the brick is inappropriate, for instance, in this little building, um, uh, but that the windows has described, um, I've forgotten how the description was, but a metal window with an imprinted uh, wood look is not, I think, something we, we would appreciate. In any event, those are a few thoughts. Uh, other commissioners will have their own thoughts as we swing around the table. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Lutfi. Um, just to, uh, I agree with Fred and, and some of the things that you mentioned just went well. So just to build on it a little bit, could we turn to page 16? Right. So I, ooh. so I think um, what you were saying, Sarah, initially, and Fred agreed, is that because of the typology of these lower scale buildings, <clears throat> there is um, this like one story rhythm of uh, <clears throat> of uh, commercial with residential on top and it starts to create uh, a, uh, I'm gonna say sort of a flow, even a rhythm that when you look at the whole block, you see even it, it, it even existed in that, uh, in the prior uh, incarnation <laughs> in this particular location and in the, and in the residential building for which, uh, you know, the, the district was not, you know, that it's no style. So I, which is not contributing. So what I think is happening here is that this building, and by the way, I, I welcome the use and it's very, you know, fitting for the city and for this particular neighborhood. So what happens is as designed, it's just like stuck there. And it actually, it, it interrupts this flow. And I, I would recommend that the applicants, again, without telling them exactly what to do, Look at the bill, look at what they've created from that perspective, put it in the, the larger vision of this particular street landscape and make some adjustments to the design. It's missing a little bit of this, you know, horizontal flow that exists here that I think needs to be uh, continued from one end of the strip to the other. And then I would also, concur that the materiality needs to be restudied. Uh, and uh, I mean, uh, it would be great if for this to be a contributing building as a new building and that the materials be of, you know, quality and that the color and that the colors, uh, the color makes sense. Okay, thank you very much. Commissioner Gustafson. Well, uh, generally speaking, um, you know, facade replacement is appropriate in in this situation. I think the um, height or massing is 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 fine. Um, I would actually um, suggest that it, um, if they had come back, come in with something uh, even taller than this, um, uh, uh, adding another floor to it, I would have, I would not have been opposed to that either. Um, looking at the way the flanking buildings um, sit. Um, I appreciate their effort to use the, um, the, the those various datum lines as references to to sort of fit the building into the into its context, but I think they're trying to make that they're stretching that that and they're trying to make that go far further than it can. Um, I and that's because when it comes down to it, materials this, the relationship between the upper floors, the lower floor, the size of the fenestration, um, all of that is inconsistent. Um, um, so the datum line is all they have left. Um, uh, and so um, I agree with my fellow commissioners and, and obviously we're not going to, I think micromanage is the word of the day today. So we're not going to micromanage that. Um, and that's all I have. 
Okay, thank you. Commissioner Shamir Barron. I'm um, very much in agreement with everything that's been said that this, you know, the horizontal line, the, the end wall to wall um, storefront horizontality is, is a, it's just a feature of many of these buildings that I think is um, missing from this new design. It's strange, it's, it's hard to really put your finger on it. I, I agree with others who have said that too. Um, the ways in which this is a very sort of on trend contemporary design, but one that we might've been able to see for it, as proposed for a new building in say like Third Avenue in the thirties or something or, or other places that Commissioner Blen noted. And so what really is the, what's sort of the difference? It's, it is very contemporary um, and it's very current and um, doesn't, it, both in its selection of materials and, um, and in the kind of the, sort of the massing of the expression of, of, the, of the facade. So I agree with others. I think that it needs to be restudied both in terms of material and in terms of um, the, the proportionality and, the, and the, the language of the facade. Thank you very much. Commissioner Chapin. Yeah, uh, I agree with the other commissioners. Uh, the uh, building itself, in an, uh, uh, the design is, is I, I think, rather attractive and could be approved in other locations, but it really doesn't seem contextual for this district and this streetscape. So, and, you know, they made a great effort to try to make it contextual in some fashion, but it really just is uh, standing out um, as a, a modern building that doesn't seem like it's at home here. Although it's, uh, you know, a, a nice enough uh, design in and of itself. So I agree Thank with you. others. Commissioner Devonshire. Yeah, I think it needs to be restudied as well. And, and I agree with John, it could actually be larger. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Commissioner Chen. Yeah, I think all the commission have excellent suggestions. Uh, we're not gonna micromanage here, but I think uh, Vice Chair's blend uh, and uh, uh, Diana Chapin's comment is correct. This, the, this building may have been very appropriate in other locations, but I think uh, John Gustafson pointed out correctly, you know, just the datum line is not going to do it. I think is there's a, uh, what the Commissioner Lofty talked about, you know, if you look at the whole, the, the whole block as a context, um, I, I like the idea of uh, maybe you, you you do bring up the building higher, I, I, but we're not going to, I'm not going to suggest it here, let, let the, uh, the applicant decide. Okay. All right. Okay, thank you all for your thoughtful comments. So we will not take an action today. We'll ask the applicants to restudy um, some of the scale of proportions and materials along the lines of our comments today and bring it back and we'll have them back as soon as they're ready with the revised proposal. So please do continue to work with the staff um, as, uh, as you start to develop some adjustments to your design. I do think that the commission welcomes contemporary designs um, and you know uh, modern abstract ideas that reflect the historic district. But I think this, as many commissioners have said, still needs some restudy and adjustment in terms of proportions, scale, and the um, distinction between maybe the upper floors and lower floors. and and the materiality that should be a, a quality and comparable to the materials in the district. Okay, so we'll take no action and we'll move to the next item. Okay, the next item is public hearing item number four, LPC 23-00251, an application for a certificate of appropriateness in the borough of Manhattan, block 625, lot 14, 613 Hudson Street in the Greenwich Village Historic District. This is a Greek revival style house designed by Edmund Hurry and built in 1848 to 51. The application is to install a railing at the roof. Okay, commissioners, the applicants have entered a hearing. John, you now have control of the presentation. If you could just click on your screen, uh, you'll be able to advance the slides using your arrow keys or your mouse. Please state your name for the record and you may begin. Uh, yes, uh, my name is John Ellis. Uh, can you hear me and can you see me? Yes, we can hear you. And see Great. Um, so the application before you commissioners is for a handrail that's approximately 20 feet wide 
atop a 1837 row house on Hudson Street. And um, this application was denied by uh, Community Board 2 a few months ago. Um, Winnie Chow, our landmark staffer, has been very, very helpful with Caroline, been very supportive in um, having us rethink um, using cables rather than pickets uh, for this design. So we've gone back and redesigned the whole thing with the cables that are 3 16 of an inch. And I'd just like to walk you through that. I think it's pretty quick. Okay. Um, so here's the uh, existing and proposed, obviously. I have to note that all my photographs, I've tried my best graphically to represent the 3 th three sixteenth inch thickness, but my AutoCAD skills aren't, aren't up to par perhaps. So uh, please bear with me. Uh, slide two, oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Uh, this is from uh, completely across the street of uh, Hudson Street, okay. Um, this is an enlargements of uh, before and after. If I'm going too fast, let me know and I'll, and I'll slow down. Uh, this is the roof, which was uh, completely redone in order to accommodate what has become a complete renovation of the envelope. Uh, the entire rear wall is rebuilt. Uh, the, the roof is entirely new. And uh, the goal of the new owner um, she's a young owner and she'd like to um, uh, get uh, years and years of enjoyment out of using the roof uh, downtown. These are uh, just a few photographs in the upper upper left hand side that show some context around the site itself and its location within the district. Uh, okay, here we come to two slides of other railing designs that are um, specifically over cornices. So I hope this will help. Um, I'll just dwell on this for just a moment if you wanna look around. And these are all within a few blocks of the site, by the way. Okay. Uh, this is details of the, of the design as a, a top rail, a foot rail, and um, some two inch by two inch stouter members at the ends. And uh, the three sixteenth wires predominate with a few one inch by two inch members to, prov to provide some stability to the horizontal members. That's about it. These are just more vantage points uh, from around the building site. Uh, this, if you can just look at the inset map, is from the uh, corner of Jane Street uh, at a diagonal. Okay. And that's the last slide. Okay. Uh, you have the floor. Okay. Thank you. Commissioners, do we have any questions? I don't see any questions at this time, so we'll see if we have public testimony. If you're in the meeting and would like to testify on this item, please raise your virtual hand so we can identify you, and I will turn it over to Gregory Kala to take us through the testimony. Thank you, Chair Caro. We did receive a few signups beforehand, uh, the first of which was Lucy Levine. So, Lucy, I will be promoting you to panelists now, and if you could just make sure your line is uh, unmuted, and state your name for public record. You will have three minutes to speak. Thank you. Thank you so much. Hello, my name is Lucy Levine, speaking on behalf of the Historic Districts Council. HDC is generally okay with this proposal, but feels that the railing should be further back from the cornice. If the railing stays at its proposed location, we feel that a 3 8 by 3 8 of an inch steel picket would be lighter and make the addition less prominently visible from the street. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Lucy. The next up, we will have uh, John Graham from Victorian Society. So John, I will be promoting you to panelists now. And if you just unmute your line and state your name for public record, you will have three minutes to speak. Thank you. Uh, 
Uh, good afternoon, commissioners. John Graham for the Victorian Society in New York. While we, are, while we certainly understand and support the desire to turn a usable roof into outdoor space and don't, in theory, have a problem with the addition of a railing to the roof, we want to ensure that the suggested railing is as discreet as possible. That said, we suggest making one change to the proposal to help it recede into the background. The proposal indicates the railing is inset 2.5 feet from the outer edge of the building's cornice. We suggest moving the fence back an additional 3.5 feet, so it's a total of six feet back to minimize the vis its visibility from the street. Thank you, commissioners. Thank you, John. And we will also be hearing from Anna Markham from Village Preservation. Uh, Anna, I will be promoting you to panelists now. So if you just unmute your line and state your name for public record, you will have three minutes to speak. Good afternoon, commissioners, and thank you for the opportunity to testify. My name is Anna Markham and I'm speaking on behalf of Village Preservation today. The applicant should do everything possible to make sure that the fence is placed at least 30 inches from the edge and is not visible from the public right of way. We are concerned about the precedent that approval of this project could create if it is not made entirely invisible. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. Uh, that is all for our uh, attendees who would like to speak on testimony. I would also like to note that uh, Manhattan Community Board 2 also recommended denial, uh, citing concerns about the uh, fence and it being a little bit too close to the edge and also suggested a uh, dark color for the color of the fence. Okay, thank you. Oh, you're thank muted, you. sorry, Sarah. thank you. Yeah. Um, so I'd like to turn back to the applicant and ask if you'd like to respond to the comments we've heard. Oh, yes, hi. Can you see me and hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you, sir. Um, yes, we, we've um, heard these comments from our staff person and I'd just like to explain that we only have about 10 feet of usable width from the front dormer to the front of the street, which makes, um, and it's a very, very small roof as you can see from the, from the uh, roof plan which just makes every bit of the roof uh, that much more valuable to us as everything else in Manhattan is. So um, we would, we would, we did have, um, speaking to one of the um, commentaries, we did have um, uh, pickets earlier. We were advised uh, by our staff person not to use the pickets. Um, we are fine either way with that. Um, we have tried to be as accurate as possible representing where the guardrail terminates and indeed it is visible. Um, I, I, we are uh, very happy to consider perhaps sloping, uh, positioning the picket close, but sloping it backwards, if that will help somewhat. Um, we'll be very happy to do that. We're just trying to gain her some place where she can put some plants and have some small recreational enjoyment. That's all it's about. Okay, thank you. And, and <laughs> color that makes you happy, we're fine with that. Okay, thank you. And the, the sloping of the fence that you suggested, that would still meet code to slope uh, yes. away from the street? We can have that. Yes, we can have that work. Okay. Okay. All right. Thank you. Commissioners, do we have any final questions? All right. I don't see any final questions, so we'll move to our discussion. Commissioner Bland, would you make a motion to close the hearing? So moved. Thank you. And Commissioner Lutfi, would you second that motion? Second. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, the hearing is closed and we'll begin our discussion. And I think, you know, there was a, a good photo that actually showed <clears throat> this, it was pulled back more and it showed this uh, proposal here, this one, in the context of the surrounding buildings. And so I think there are times when we look at a very uniform row and streetscape of, of row houses that are all the same height and something projecting above can be very detracting. And in those cases, we have asked for think, fences and other rooftop features to be invisible. Um, but we have also in places where there's very roofscapes, 
um, had considered minimally visible installations to be appropriate. And so I think this is a, a varied streetscape where you have a taller building with visible fence, lower building built infra, uh, equipment and other buildings behind it. So um, I think we can have a discussion about what the right amount of visibility is and think about what the applicant's offer is to slope it back. So Commissioner Gustafson, would you start this discussion? Uh We'll start with this. Um, in terms of uh, visibility, <clears throat> we don't have an absolute um, rule about visibility, which is to say it's not the case that um, if it is uh, 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 slightly visible that we would not accept it. Um, I, um, I think though we do have, uh, we tend towards the notion that the, uh, the every applicant should be doing their best to reduce that visibility as much as possible. So um, I don't know how that would turn out with uh, the uh, uh, angling of that fence. Um, and so I can't really, it's hard to imagine how that's gonna look, um, but that is certainly something I would want them to do uh, to reduce that visibility. Um, I would also note that, you know, while I am in favor of activating rooftops, um, you know, when they say that there's only 10 feet there, I'm not sure that every rooftop in the, in the on the island of Manhattan um, is eligible for activation um, if it requires it to uh, to be an obtrusive um, um, addition. So, um, in any event, um, I think they can work with staff to um, to figure out how to uh, make that fence as invisible as possible. Okay, thank you, Commissioner Shamir Barron. Yeah, as much as I um, would have preferred that that a fence like this would not be visible from the public thoroughfare. I think there are so many um, examples that they've shared with us and that uh, we're aware of in the area and in the district that where, where a fence is visible at the roof. And I just find that while those don't serve necessarily as precedent, they, they are examples of sort of something that we've seen at the street, streetscape that's kind of that we accept, that we understand, and that doesn't get in the way of our recognizing cornices and the termination of buildings in their historic configuration. So I think I can actually approve it as it's presented though, um, if they can work with staff to minimize visibility or um, make the material be even less kind of prominent and the color as well, I think that would be fine. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Chapin? Uh, yeah, uh, I think it's fine to have uh, the fence in this context be somewhat visible. I think sloping it back is a good idea. Um, I'm a little puzzled by the staff who thought they should fit, you know, with recommended cables because it appears that most of these are just post fences. And I think, personally, I think a dark post fence, uh, you know, just would have been more appropriate. I, if I understand correctly, the, the posts and the rail will be dark and then the cables are gonna be a mill finish uh, stainless steel. And I think a dark fence would be better in this context altogether. And I don't know how easy it would be to paint the cables as opposed to just painting a, a standard picket type fence. So I don't know what others think about this. I, if everyone is okay with the, the color and so forth, I can approve it, I think, because it's not going to be very visible. And I think it should be uh, angled back working with the staff. Okay. All right. Thank you. And I think that, that we have found in our experience that the wire mesh reads as very transparent. And so I think that is where that recommendation came from. Um, but your point is taken about the two different colors. Commissioner Devonshire? Yeah, I think it needs to be less visible, uh, whatever means they can uh, use working with staff. Okay, Commissioner Chen? Yeah, same, 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 uh, I mean, agreement. I think if we can make it less visible, and I know we have a very capable staff, so I would defer to the staff in this instance. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Bland? Um, anybody that wants to use their roof it has my sympathy and empathy, so I think that's a, a good thing. Um, 
but I also agree with most of the other commissioners who've spoken that it should be less visible uh, by any means that the staff figures is is right, in, including picket that's bent or, or um, angled back and painted black. I think that's fine. I'm not sure I understand the mesh idea. I think that might even perhaps bring more attention to it because it's just a different sort of thing, as well as cable. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> Commissioner Leffey? I agree, working with staff to minimize visibility makes sense. And I, I happen to agree with Diana about the color. Uh, so whatever that becomes as they explore it would, uh, you know, make sense to me. Okay. Okay, why don't I go ahead and I'll make this motion, try to capture the purpose. All right, in the matter of um, docket number, 23-002516013 Hudson Street in the Greenwich Village Historic District, a Greek Revival style house designed by Edmund Hurry and built in 1848 to 51. This is an application to install railings at the roof. And I note that the building style scale material and details are among the features that contribute to the special architectural and historic character of the Greenwich Village Historic District. I recommend approval with modifications, finding that the work will not alter, damage, or destroy any significant architectural features at the roof, that the railing will be of an open design and uh, it's typical of rooftop accretions in terms of material dimensions and finish, that the uh, roof line along the streetscape is busy and varied and the wideness of Hudson Street would make a minimally visible railing difficult to achieve even if set further back. Therefore, the presence of a visible railing, railing near the front of the roof will not detract from the building or the street, streetscape which features other rooftop accretions. However, I recommend that the applicant work with the staff to explore options to make reduce the visibility of the railing, including considering angling it away from the street and uh, considering the materials and a uniform dark color. Okay, with, so Commissioner uh, Shamir Barron, would you second that motion? Second. All in favor, oh, sorry, Mark, will you call the vote? Mayor Carroll. Aye. Commissioner Bland? Aye. <clears throat> Commissioner Shamir Barron? Aye. Commissioner Chapin? Aye. Commissioner Chen? Aye. Commissioner Devonshire? Aye. Commissioner Gustafson? Aye. Commissioner Lutfi? Aye. With eight in favor, none opposed, the motion passes. Okay, so that's approved with those modifications. Please continue to work with the staff to explore how to reduce the visibility and we'll now move to the next item. And the next item is public hearing item number five, LPC 23-00004, an application for a certificate of appropriateness in the Borough of Manhattan, Block 580, 585, Lot 24, 95 Bedford Street in the Greenwich Village Historic District. This is a building with Queen Anne style elements designed by Kurtzer and Cole as a stable in 1894 and converted into apartments and offices in 1927. The application is to alter facades enlarge an interior courtyard and construct a rooftop addition. Okay, commissioners, the applicants have entered the hearing. They now have control of the presentation. Uh, Sarah, you can advance the slides using your arrow keys or your mouse. Um, the applicant team may begin. Please state your name for the record before you do so. Sorry, I was muted. Um, thanks, Abby. Um, uh, good afternoon, Commissioners. Erin Rooley, Higgins, Quays, Barth & Partners. We are the preservation consultants for this project. I'm joined today by Morgan Hare. Morgan is a partner at Leroy Street Studios, and they are the architects. Um, this is a project um, to convert the existing building, which is currently apartments and a ground floor art studio, uh, to a single family residence with an art studio. The owner is an artist and she'll continue that artistic use of the building. Um, this is a, a somewhat excep exceptional project. I think as Morgan will explain, uh, it's a model of sustainability and um, including its method of construction, which is um, somewhat new 
I think that we'll see today. And um, it's carefully crafted to limit its visibility and introduce a, a thoughtfully designed layer at the, at the secondary elevations. And so I think, Sarah, next slide. So we're situated on the west side of uh, Bedford Street between Grove and Barrow that you see here. Um, the building is on the right. Of course, we're in the Greenwich Village Historic District. Uh, the building is a four-story um, Queen Anne style building that was originally constructed in 1894 as a stable. And at that time it was uh, stable on all four floors and a portion of the fourth floor was an apartment. Um, and then it was subsequently altered in the twenties um, to expand that residential use um, to the third and fourth floors. Um, and then there were subsequent alterations, but the base and the window configuration that we see today dates to the 1920s condition. Next slide. So here we have a sort of an overview of the of the project, but also gives you a sense of the the existing building on the left. Um, so you can see it volumetrically. Um, there is a light well in the in the middle of the building, <clears throat> and um, uh, an exposed north elevation that's partially visible from the street um, that has um, uh, windows throughout the the. Um, facade. And so you'll see we're proposing to uh, restore the primary facade. And then at that light well at the on the secondary elevation on the north, really expanding and reinterpreting that. Um, and that is all part of a, a, a integrated into a sculptural one story addition. Um, the, the addition has very limited visibility, as we'll see, but the um, uh, form of it is divided into three parts. The front section is a an open pergola. The second section, um, the middle is uh, a, a skylight that lights the, the core of the building and ties into the, the new light well. And then um, of course the, the roof structure at the rear. And then um, what we can't see in this axon is a, a proposed studio window that's on the west elevation, but we'll see that when we um, start to work our way around the building and the design proposal. Um, this is a, a, a commercial scale building. Um, it was a stable historically and so um, and has changed over time to accommodate the evolving residential use. And this project continues that that lineage. Um, there's limited visibility and where it is visible, it results from uh, a complex and unique condition within this specific block that we'll, we'll look at in depth. Um, and uh, we of course think <clears throat> that this new layer is a, is a worthy addition to that inherent richness of the place. Um, <clears throat> next slide, Sarah. Great, so just sort of stepping back and taking a look at the history of the block and the site. Um, it's really has a very rich history um, and results from the, the intersection or the collision of the city's varying street patterns. So in the, this map on the left side of the, the sheet, we see um, it's an 1803 map. You see the existing um, early Greenwich Village street grid. Um, and what's outlined in blue is the Trinity Church Farm. And um, our, our block, subject block, is, is highlighted in red here. Um, but the, the blue outline, Trinity's property, which of course extended all the way down through Tribeca to Lower Manhattan, um, was uh, had a separate street grid. Trinity, when they laid their streets, they oriented them perpendicular to the, to the waterfront. And that intersection, the, the the intersection of the Trinity streets with the Greenwich Village street grid, existing Greenwich Village street grid, really establishes that, that bend that we see, that characteristic bend that we see in all of the streets south of Christopher Street. So Grove, Barrow, Morton, and so on. Um, and that, so that this these sort of ancient farm lines are the genesis of the unique form of this block. And of course, the urban condition that results from it. Next slide. Uh, we see that in a little more in depth at a, a smaller scale here um, in, in the block 1854 map, just showing you the, the early condition of the block. So here you can, you can see where the, the two grids intersect and the angles it creates. Um, our site is, is outlined in red and uh, the, these are a grouping of earlier buildings that existed on the site. Um, and the, behind the site, are the buildings that are now known as Grove Court, 
but originally known as Ten and a Half Grove Street. Um, and those are developed in the 1840s, um, as is much of the block, uh, the, the first generation of development on this block. On the right, we see um, uh, 1895 map. So the building is constructed in 1894. This is the early state of the block at that time. Um, and you can see these, um, um, the, the relationships that result from the intersection of the street grids. So you get uh, buildings at odd angles, lots, irregularly shaped lots, lots of exposed side elevations. I mean, this is characteristic of the village, of course, um, but that juxtaposition of, of front facades and side elevations and, and, and views into the mid block, all created as a result of, of this unique street pattern that we see in, in Greenwich Village particularly. Um, the building itself, is a, um, you can see the original form of it. It was four stories in the front, four stories in the back, and then a three-story section in the middle of the building. It steps down in the middle of the building. And that, I think, separated the uses between something like a hayloft and, and the apartment at that time. And, um, and you can see that it fully occupies its site. So it uh, has lot line, the, the building fully extends to the lot line on the north and the west elevations. And um, so it abuts the rear yards of these Grove Street buildings to the north and um, of course, Grove Court um, to the west. Next slide. Just a, a view here, this is looking at Grove Court. Grove Court originally constructed in the 1840s and then um, rehabilitated in, in the 1920s like many of the buildings in the village. Um, and so we're looking um, from Grove Court to the rear facade of 95 Bedford. And um, you see a, a single line of windows there. That is the uh, an early generation of a fenestration that evolves over time as well. And um, also of note here is the, the changing scale. So you see that, that mid 19th century development of, of Grove Court juxtaposed with the 1890s stable. And then of course, the, to the south of the stable, the, um, the late 19th century tenements that front along Bedford Strait. Um, and the map on the right really, it represents that same, that same period of development. Next slide. Um, in the 1920s, the, the building is acquired by J. Goebel and Company. Goebel were um, manufacturers of clay crucibles. They were used in the, in the manufacture of glass. So um, the, uh, the building was converted for commercial use on the basement or cellar first and second floors. And then the third and fourth floors were converted to an expanded residential use. And this had changes throughout the building that we'll look at, but um, on the primary facade, that was an entirely new base. We see this new stucco, light finished stucco base um, with the paired um, loading doors and a pedestrian entry at the south side. Uh, the sign over the loading doors is, uh, it's, uh, a Goebel sign, it remains today, um, has crucibles integrated into the motif. It's quite lovely, but the, um, the motif on the south entry has been, um, is missing. And that's part of our proposed scope of work today. Um, and then on the upper floors, the, um, the windows were changed to multi-light casements. Um, next slide. So here we just get a sense of the, how the use of the building evolved over time and, and its impact on the physical form. Um, so uh, originally, so a, a 1904 representation of what we think was the, the earliest state of the building, um, a simple window configuration of, of one or two windows in each bay um, for, the, for the stable use of the building. In the 1920s, that changes and um, the, and of course in the early condition, there's that one story step down in the building separating the four story sections from the three story sections, right? And then in um, the late 1920s, we see that light well extended down another floor. So it takes it down to the roof of the second floor and then added windows on the, the north elevation. And this is really to provide light and air for the new residential units on the third floor with the windows fronting onto the light well and to um, onto the north elevation. And then in the 1960s, the ground floor use was converted for 
um, uh, artist studio. And so we see the introduction of these larger scale paired windows on the, the ground floor. Um, they continue around to the west elevation as well on the rear of the building um, and, and provide more uh, light into the into the ground floor space. And so the evolution, the, the, the elevation has evolved to respond to that changing use, bringing light and air into the building. Next slide. Um, and then just a, a sort of tour around the building. Uh, here's an overall view uh, we see from, from the street. So we're standing on Bedford um, front facade. We see the exposed secondary elevation and again, um, a view afforded because of these, these um, breaks in the street wall and the sort of idiosyncrasies of, of the, the street pattern in, in Greenwich Village. We're looking over the wall of um, the adjacent rear yard. So this white wall belongs to the neighboring property. Um, on the right, uh, the exist some existing conditions of the front facade, the paired uh, casement, multi-light casement windows, these will be replaced in kind. And then, of course, the base of the building, um, you'll see the Goebel sign and um, the um, area above the pedestrian entry. You, you notice there's been stucco loss that's been coated over, um, and that was the location of that uh, wreath motif over the over the entry door. Next slide. Great. And then uh, just a couple of views, the, the front roof on the left and the um, rear roof on the right and then a couple of views of the of the light well the existing light well you have to step to the on the view to the bottom on the bottom left you have to step to the north to see this um, you don't see it really in conjunction the depth of the wall in conjunction with the primary facade but you see the fenestration and the the existing light well there next slide uh, and then, of course, the, the building is fully occupying its site. So this this is the rear wall and the north elevation. Um, we are standing in our neighbor's property. We're on Grove Court, um, which is, of course, a private alleyway and not the public way. Um, but it's the only place to um, get a good view of the existing conditions of the, the rear and side facades. Next slide. Great. And so I think we're, um, we'll pass the presentation to Morgan now, but before we get to the specifics of the design, I think we'd like to share some thinking about the design and its connection to this place. Um, this is a design that is literally rooted in the building. Um, it's inspired by the existing timber framing of the, of the stable construction, um, which is substantially retained as part of the project. Um, and of course, it's neighboring trees and green space. Um, and then the sculptural character of the roof draws on the the long history of artist windows and eccentric roof lines that we see in the immediate context, um, all in a way that is that is minimally visible. And I think, next slide. Here we see how that context comes together um, and how it's perceived from the street. So the restored facade on Bedford Street, there will be no visibility over the, the primary facade. And then just looking um, from Bedford at the um, toward the building, we see that exposed secondary elevation and the minimal visibility of the of the addition glimpsed through the the break in the in for the um, courtyard wall, um, and so this introduces a, a beautifully designed layer to that side elevation um, that really ties into the, the glimpses into the mid block that have evolved from as part of the building's history and the, and the site's history. Um, and uh, we think this engages the, the evolving character of the north elevation and adds to the complexity and, and richness of the block. And I think with that, um, I'll pass the presentation to Morgan. Thank you. Um, can you hear me? Good. Um, my name is Morgan Hare from Leroy Street Studio, and I'm here with Pauline Shu, our project lead. Um, I want to thank the commissioners and our clients who have um, given us this opportunity for a very exciting um, project. Um, they're attending the meeting. Um, and they've given us an opportunity to develop this building um, with a history of adaptive reuse. Um, it's an unusual building for the West Village. Um, by introducing a state-of-the-art uh, mass timber and glue lamb structure, um, 
I should note that the project is close to my heart because we founded our studio at uh, Leroy Street, just uh, three blocks away, uh, 25 years ago, since since we've moved to the um, Lower East Side. Um, we're collaborating on the design with um, Reinhard Knopf of uh, Helen and Hard Architects, um, who have a deep experience in uh, timber design. Um, and uh, we're very happy to be working with them. Um, Ari and Siri Trosdale, um, who will be the, who are the owners of the building, will be using it as their primary residence um, to raise their family and also as an art studio for Siri. Um, our next slide. Um, from the beginning of this project, uh, the project team uh, identified five points that we wanted to um, uh, achieve for the success of the design and project design. Um, the first was this idea of this natural and, and organic experience, um, uh, which was this core concept of the building, which Aaron alluded to. Um, it's this, the, when we came to site, this massive London plane tree that, that towers over Grove Court, um, really became kind of a symbolic touchstone um, for the project, um, representing both the context and also our client's desire to create a home using mass timber um, structure with natural materials. Um, we conceived of the project as this historical brick wrapper within that encompasses this um, organic structure, this wood structure. Um, then by using a design process, uh, this parametric uh, digital design, we were able to uh, really model the interior structure and use um, using a point cloud to identify the existing structure, which enables us to be much have much tighter tolerances for the project and build more of the um, project components offsite, um, which will allow for quality control. Um, this healthy building technology is as part of the, um, the goal of the project was to take this, this um, 19th century building and bring it up to the 20th century, 21st century with, um, with uh, the most healthy ecological technology possible. Um, we're using materials with low carbon impact, mass timber, clay wall, um, clay lime walls, cellulose insulation, um, and really limiting the use of steel and concrete or other manufactured materials. Um, with the goal of having a carbon neutral project um, using PV, roof planting, passive ventilation, and other strategies. Um, the uh, fourth uh, part was this timber fabrication, which um, Helen Hart has really helped us with. And it's a state of the art um, timber fabrication, which is um, being done off site and brought as modular pieces um, and assembled on site. Um, we're retaining over 50% of the interior um, wood structure um, and um, augmenting it with this new um, uh, offsite fabricated structure, which ties into it. Um, and then lastly, um, we really appreciated this building um, and its history of adaptive reuse. And we wanted to continue that with the, the, the spirit of this um, new design with the artist studio and now a home um, for, for the Trosdales. Um, next slide. Uh, this is the axon that you've seen before. Um, uh, Aaron kind of described everything here. I just point out the um, uh, we, that we've kept the elevator overrun and the uh, mechanical terrace um, to the south uh, side of the building to keep them out of view um, from uh, the street. Um, and you can see the reconfigured court. The, um, Glass around the port is is held back and, and screened from view by the um, by the screen wall by the um, rebuilding the brick wall and um, introducing the screen at the lower level. Um, uh, let's see. Let's see. The, uh, there, there's no change. I should just mention that there is no change in the um, uh, zoning area of the building. It's just been reconfigured. Um, next slide. Um, these are the materials we're using. Um, exposed um, structural Douglas fir, um, the roof uh, PV panels. This is a shingle system uh, as opposed to the typical um, standard panels that one sees. Um, the coping and flashing is painted metal. Um, there's a extension to the um, parapet uh, guardrail, which is glass. 
um, most of the of the um, parapet is is already existing. Um, the existing um, facade, we're restoring the existing brick. Um, any patches will be using um, reclaimed brick to match. Um, and then the um, as let's see as um, Aaron mentioned. Um, we're restoring the ground level to the 1920s color scheme. Um, and then the upper level is closer to the turn of the century, um, the, the supposed um, original um, color selection. Um, next slide. Um, this slide you've already seen before. We just took out the foliage, um, which the intention is to have it remain. But um, we just wanted to give you a view of the um, reconfiguration of the sidewall uh, to the um, to the um, north, um, and you can see a little bit of the um, internal glazing of the kitchen um, at the top there. We included this little axon so you can see what you're looking at. That that little red triangle is what you're actually seeing through the opening in the um, center image that one right there that's right um the existing chimney um we have to extend for code it's very similar to the um similar chimney that's on the corner building which i think is in the appendix um uh slides i think on page 41 but we won't go there um and as you can see there's a minimal view of, the, of any of this new construction from the public way um, the parapet has been raised slightly, starting at the, the existing height and then continuing that same elevation. Um, so I'm not sure how well you can see that in this, in this view. We can look at it in the elevation later. Um, the next uh, slide. Uh, so this is the view from Grove Court. Um, and, um, this is, shows the uh, window that we're introducing, which um, our intention was to have this window start to rescale the rear of, um, of this building, which kind of is out of scale for the um, for Grove Court um, and the uh, Muse houses adjacent. Um, based on the feedback that we got from the community board, we have added an, another mullion to it, another vertical mullion, and we've pitched it back a little more to um, give it more kind of a sense of the artist's window. Um, um, and you can also see the mechanical terrace there at the top of the roof, just a little bit there. Um, but again, this is from Grove Court, which is not in the public way. Um, let's see, uh, next slide. So this is the elevation. Um, the east elevation uh, from the street. Um, and uh, Aaron spoke about this, but um, the um, wreath that is over the front door um, there, that's the wreath, um, piece that's missing. Um, from the photograph, we could see that it was a um, this wreath with some kind of, of signage inside. The proposal is to um, recreate that wreath and um, put the letters um, of the owner's um, names uh, in there as a kind of updating of the original signage. Um, the uh, casement windows are being replaced with um, double pane um, glass in, to match the existing casement um, windows. Um, uh, there's, a there's an enlarged detail of this in the appendix on, pa on page 38. Um, uh, next slide. Um, this one shows the um, north elevation existing. Um, we've dotted in the openings in the uh, for the new, the reconfigured, um, reoriented court, just so you can see it. And here, probably the best place to see the parapet um, extension. You can see the, the line, that dotted line is the new parapet, um, line of the new parapet. Um, next slide. This shows the proposed elevation. Um, and this, this elevation is a little confusing. We're looking into the court and those, the um, big uh, curtain wall there on the top is set back um, the depth of the court um, and um, shielded from the street by the, um, by the brick wall, by the screen wall. 
Um, next elevation. Um, so this is the Grove Court elevation um, showing those uh, windows um, and then the replacement of the um, existing windows with double hung windows again to match the existing. Um, we are patching uh, some air conditioner um, uh, openings there um, and um, recoding this sidewall and rear facade with a vapor permeable paint um, in, a, in a very similar color to what it is today. Um, and then the next slide. Is that, is that the, oh yeah, okay. Um, and then this is a roof plan. So this shows the um, proposed and the existing. Um, the proposal is to occupy the front half of the roof. Um, and um, you can see the, um, the extension of this new roof, which projects over the, the um, outdoor area on the roof and allows for access. Um, the elevator bulkhead is shown there and the mechanical equipment. Um, location. Um, and, um, and then the next slide. So I think um, I'm going to, Aaron has done such an amazing cogent job. I think I'm going to pass it back to her and let her go through the views and the mock ups that, that we've built for you. Thanks, Morgan. I think um, so. We'll just take a, a quick walk around the block. Um, I think as I Stated earlier, it's not none of the um, modifications are visible over the primary facade, um, including the, the the chimney, which is the uh, sort of foremost um, element in terms of the the alterations. And here on this um, diagram on the right, we can see the the various vantage points. Um, and again, these are all related to those those uh, breaks in the in the street wall that we get uh, throughout the village. Um, and so we'll just take a look at each one of those um, as we're heading around the block. Next slide. So here again, just moving a little bit to the north on, on um, Bedford Street. So we right now we have full tree cover. Um, and so it masked a lot of the, the mock up. So we rendered into um, the existing view on the left was a was an earl of photographs in the earlier part of the year. This is consistent throughout all of the mock up views. Um, and then the mock up and the renders happen to um, primarily to the, the winter views or the, the spring views before everything's fully leaked out. So in the mock-up view, we're seeing uh, the um, chimney extension and that parapet increase along the leveling out of that parapet there. Um, and then of course the, the, the light well is relocated in this and we see that in the, the rendered view on the right there, right? So this is really the, the point of, of maximum visibility where you see anything in connection with the primary facade. Next slide. Um, moving a little farther um, north along Bedford Street across the street, we see the, um, the parapet extension and the, the chimney extension. And then in the distance, the, um, the elevator bulkhead and in the rendered view, you see how that all comes together. Um, fairly minimal in, in composition. Next slide. So this is this is a, a pretty limited view. There is a, a small window of visibility when, when you um, turn onto Grove Street um, heading east and it's through the trees. There's a small break in the street wall. You don't see it in conjunction with the primary facade, but you get a glimpse of the roof rising. So this is the sort of the high point of the of the skylight structure in the in the roof um, that you see there. Um, and then on the right is um, a view farther no north on Bedford Street where you see just the chimney and the the um, parapet extension. Um, what you can't see in this um, view because of the, the leaf cover is this the continuity of the, the chimney in the in the street context. There's a the chimney in the background, but there's also a chimney in the foreground on the, the um, white building on the corner. So it, it fits nicely into that context. Next slide. Um, the break, uh, this is the entry into Grove Court. So this is on Grove Street looking through the gate um, where one gains access to Grove Court um, and there's no visibility from this view. Next slide. 
And then um, at the distance in on Hudson Street, looking through a break in the street wall to, between two apartment buildings, the alleyway. Um, on the left is the existing view. So you can see the rear in the winter view on the existing, you can see the winter view of the rear facade. So it's a season, this is a seasonal view into the alleyway. Um, and on the right is the rendered view showing the um, the studio window and then the mechanical equipment and the roof sort of rising up above it from there. Again, very, very limited view between um, buildings. Next slide. And then finally, similarly on Barrow Street, break between two buildings um, in the uh, seasonal view that you'll have um, showing that side elevation and a portion of the, um, the uh, studio window and you just catch a hint of the, the roof rising um, toward the east um, as it as it heads back and that's I think that's the last view right yes and so I think with that we'll take any questions you might have all right great thank you do we have any questions commissioners all right I don't see any questions at this time so we'll move to public testimony if you're in the meeting and would like to speak on this item, please raise your virtual hand so we can identify you. And I'll turn it over to Gregory Kala to take us through the testimony. Thank you, Chair Carroll. We received a few signups in advance for this uh, application. The first of which is uh, John Graham. Oh, and I see Anna Markham raising her hand. So Anna Markham, I will promote you to panelists now. So please unmute your line, state your name for public record, and you will have three minutes to speak. Hello, commissioners, and thank you for the opportunity to testify. My name is Anna Markham, and I am speaking on behalf of Village Preservation. 95 Bedford Street is a uniquely important building within the Greenwich Village Historic District, as pointed out in the Historic District Designation Report. While we appreciate that the architect made the addition lower and less visible in the front, we remain concerned that this heavy-handed, aggressively modern-looking addition would nevertheless be visible from multiple vantage points. The visibility renderings as presented do not seem to match up with the mass of the addition rendered at the street level elevation and bird's eye view rendering of the proposed design. We also encourage the applicant to reconsider the glass curtain wall of windows at the rear facade, as mentioned by Community Board 2. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. We will now be hearing from John Graham from Preser uh, Victorian Society. John, I am promoting you to panelists now. So if you get on your line and state your name, you will have three minutes to speak. Good afternoon, Commissioners. Uh, John Graham for the VSNY. The VSNY has two concerns with the proposed work at 95 Bedford Street. The first has to do with the paint colors the applicant has selected for the front facade. We take note of two things demonstrated in the black and white tax photo from the 1940s. First, the gray tones for all the different elements on the front facade, the ground floor stucco, the brick, the string courses, the window frames, the cornice, are all fairly close together. The ground floor stucco is the lightest color, but there are no bright whites or deep blacks in the 1940s photo. But when we converted the applicant's rendering of the proposed repainted facade to black and white, the contrasts are very dramatic. Uh, we provided a copy of this screenshot uh, to the commissioners, but just for the children at home, I will show the screenshot. But when we converted the applicant's rendering of the proposed repainted facade to black and white, the contrasts are very dramatic. This diminishes the unity of the facade and calls too much attention to individual elements. We recommend that the proposed black paint on the garage doors and the cornice and the limestone color paint on the ground floor be restudied to create a more uniform palette. We also recommend that the ground floor paint color not be such a close match to the garden wall of the adjacent house. Our other concern had to do with the elimination of the historic north-facing studio window shown on boards 3 and 15. 
This is on the rear portion of the building in an area that doesn't seem to be visible from any street. However, studio windows are considered a protected feature of buildings in Greenwich Village. The design should be modified to retain this studio window. Thank you very much, commissioners. Thank you, John. And we will now be hearing from Lucy Levine. And Lucy, I will be promoting you to panelists now. So if you could please unmute your line and state your name for public record, you will have three minutes to speak. Thank you very much. Hello, my name is Lucy Levine speaking on behalf of the Historic Districts Council. HDC appreciates the design of the hidden rooftop addition and the effort to restore the historic color of the base, but wonders why only the base is being treated to restoration. HDC feels that the base, lintels, and horizontal bands should be uniform. If this project seeks to restore the base to its historic color, it should also include the lintels and the and the horizontal bands in that restoration. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lucy. And uh, for the record, I would like to note that Manhattan Community Board 2 does recommend approval of many components of this application uh, with some visibility concerns on uh, the fourth floor opening. And it does recommend denial of the new fourth floor studio window on the rear facade since it is visible from Hudson Street and not harmonious with the building. Uh, we also received two letters from nearby residents also citing concerns about visibility. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so it, just as a point of clarification, I believe all of the work at the primary facade is being reviewed at staff level. It's restorative and approach and eligible for a staff level permit. So I uh, would thank the comments on the work on the front facade and our staff can take those into consideration as we consider uh, the application for the front with the applicants. Our uh, focus today, and I'll ask the applicants to respond to the comments addressing the window changes on the side and rear facade, including the studio window and the rooftop addition, although we actually didn't get that many comments on the rooftop addition. Uh, thanks, Sarah. Uh, so I'll skip the the paint colors. Um, uh, as as you know, we we have a, an approach to that which is um, uh, based on the the history and and alterations um, to the facade. So happy to work that out with staff. Um, the uh, visibility, we stand by the visibility assessment, of course, um, the, the bird's eye views are, are deceptive. I mean, it's the best way to explicate a project, but um, it doesn't represent what you see. Um, and we, we believe our renderings and mock-up are, are true and accurate. Um, the uh, uh, community board, comments about the studio window. We did make modifications. We added an additional mullion to try to break down the scale of that a little bit. It's not intended to read like a curtain wall. Um, I just think that the way you have to drop the rendering in from that view of, of Hudson Street from Hudson Street makes it, um, it, it doesn't have the necessarily the, the character of, or the detail that you're, you would um, represent in reality. Um, and I think that um, part of the visibility issue, um, it, it, it's visible through that secondary elevation. But um, much in the way that the street configurations create these glimpses into the mid block, the, the building is a kind of microcosm of that. You're getting these views from the street through the building um, into this um, special place. And I think that the, the quality of the design, the level of design here really um, uh, is worthy of that small amount of visibility. Um, and that the, the glassiness is not, you know, standard curtain wall construction. This is you know, very finely detailed and crafted um, addition. And what we're looking at here in this view, this is a great place to stand for this um, discussion because we're looking up through the addition into the roof structure. And so there's going to be a, an incredible level of detail and, and richness in what's presented here versus just a, a, a standard curtain wall. Um, and I think that that um, covers all of the non-paint okay. issues. Um, Great. Yeah, I would just add, this is Morgan, I would just add that the that, that rear studio window um, we did pitch back more so it's actually angled 
So it's would be less reflective um, from oh, the view and, in Hudson Street. And, Morgan, that's a good point. The um, and I think um, the Victorian Society comment about retaining the the existing studio window. Um, it is not visible from the street, um, and it doesn't date to the 1920s alterations. It's actually it, it doesn't show up. We don't know the date of it, but it doesn't show up in at least by the 1940s, it's not there. So it's um, in terms of the, the building documentation. So we know it's a much later addition um, and not one that was visible or, or expressed uh, as part of the, the overall um, expression of that 1920s alteration. Okay, thank you very much. All right, commissioners, do we have any final questions? All right, I'm not seeing any final questions, so I think we will start to get ready to close the hearing and begin our discussion. All right, Commissioner Lutfi, would you make a motion to close the hearing? So moved. And Commissioner Chen, would you second that motion? Second. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, the hearing is closed and we'll begin our discussion. And while we did hear uh, about the restoration work on the front facade, we, we should limit our comments to the window changes on the side and the rear facade. And we've heard that some comments from the community board on the studio window, um, which has been modified since it was presented to the community board by angling it back more and adding another million. And um, and then the uh, overall rooftop addition and creating the light well. So Commissioner Shamir Barron, would you like to start this one? Sure. Uh, so as ever, fascinating to hear from um, the present presenters, the incredible history of this building and uh, valuable to understand how many um, changes it's been through and how those uh, changes are um, marked um, on the on the face of the building, how we understand change, whether it has to do with the street patterns or it has to do with the use um, of the building over time and its various levels um, are articulated and expressed on the building. So that, that's very interesting because it means that it, in my mind that um, there is room for further expression of change um, as part of the kind of the historic um, continuation of, of things here and at this building. So um, I think nearly everything that has been presented in my mind is appropriate. The, both the elimination of um, certain windows on the, on the lower floors, the um, addition of the artists and, and with the further um, refinement that the community board has asked them to do um, on the upper floor, the, um, the rooftop addition and the ways in which it's not particularly visible um, in terms of the kind of full understanding of its height from the street view, I think is, is very important. And yet um, carving, you know, continuing this kind of carving deeper of the kind of court area and element in uh, as, as it had previously been done, but with more, um, more and sort of more further accentu accentuated glass um, surface on that courtyard makes perfect sense. Um, I, I just think that nearly everything that's being proposed is reasonable. It's not excessive. And despite the fact that, and, and it, the fact that it's visible is not um, sort of in conflict with what we've known to read on the face of this building. So I can actually prove everything that's been proposed um, and I'm curious to hear what others think. Okay, thank you. All right, Commissioner Chapin. Uh, yes, I, I agree with uh, Addie's comments. And when I first looked at this, I thought, wow, it's, it's a really uh, a striking concept, design concept, and very interesting debate. Then I looked, uh, thought about it further, and I thought, well, uh, it's, it's a large building, and, the, um, and it's, you know, it's well integrated and fitting into the existing building. And also, it, it has very minimal visibility. So I thought, no, oh, that's it, that's it's actually working very well. And I like the way that it draws on the pergola concept and the um, sense of the, you know, historic artist studios in the village. And uh, I think everything just works really. <coughs> and uh, 
I, I'm ha I can <coughs> approve it as presented. Okay, thank you very much. Commissioner Devonshire. I think it's appropriate. Okay, Commissioner Chen. Likewise, yes, very well done. Commissioner Bland. Very exciting scheme, and I think completely appropriate uh, for the many changes that the board <clears throat> has been through. This is a very exciting uh, artistic uh, expression of, um, of uh, you know, of this um, uh, renovation. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Lutfi. I mean, I agree. It's very well done. It's... Um, I mean, I have to really commend the applicant for being very thoughtful in terms of the approach, for uh, making this a passive house, essentially, for incorporating, you know, outdoor space in an interior way that is not obtrusive, for uh, incorporating at the rear the an artist studio window. I, I love the community board's recommendation that <clears throat> tilting, uh, you know, tilting it backwards so it's less obtrusive, but it completely fits in with uh, other uh, mm -hmm. studio, you know, studio windows in uh, the village in this area, and uh, and the restoration work. It's really, really well done, and I, I, I think it's the maybe the size and the shape of the building, and the fact that there have been changes and. Um, and, you know, incursions have made this work in a way that is so overall unobtrusive in so many instances, I feel like uh, we spent a lot of time trying to shave back uh, additions, but uh, the form itself has aided this concept and, and it's been handled really, really well. Great, thank you. And Commissioner Gustafson. Appropriate as is, I have nothing to add. Okay, so I think we have a consensus. Commissioner Shamir Barron, would you make a motion? Sure. In the matter of LPC 2300004, 95 Bedford Street, Greenwich Village Historic District, a building with Queen Anne style elements designed by Kurtzer and Cole as a stable in 1894 and converted into apartments and offices in 1927. The application is to alter facades, enlarge an interior courtyard and construct a rooftop addition. I note that the building's style, scale, materials and details are among the features that contribute to the special architectural and historic character of the Greenwich Village Historic District and I recommend approval, finding that the proposed work will not eliminate or damage any significant architectural features of the building, that the building has been modified throughout its history and therefore the proposed visible addition, new and modified masonry openings at the north and west facade and large inner courtyard are in keeping with the history of alterations at the building. If the building is of a singular design, therefore the alterations will not uh, detract from the uniform row. That the proposed sculpted rooftop addition will be minimally visible from a distance at oblique angles from the Hudson and Barrow streets, from Hudson and Barrow streets, and only a small portion of the underside of the rooftop addition will be seen from the Bedford Street uh, from Bedsford Street through the expanded courtyard opening on the north facade, that the neutral color and material palette will blend with the facades and allow the addition to recede from view, and that the elevation bulkhead and flue extensions will be minimally visible from Bedford Street and the corner of Bedford and Grove Streets, and their presence will be keeping in keeping with visible rooftop structures found throughout the historic district. That the enlarged masonry opening at the west facade will feature a glass curtain wall and will recall a studio window, a typical feature found in the historic district and the proposed work will not detract from the special architectural and historic character of the building and the historic district. Thank you very much. Commissioner Chapin, would you second that motion? Second. Mark, will you call the vote? Chair Carroll? Aye. Commissioner Bland? Aye. Commissioner Shamir Barron? Aye. Commissioner Chapin? Aye. Commissioner Chen? Aye. Commissioner Devonshire? Aye. Commissioner Gustafson? Aye. Commissioner Ludvi? Aye. With eight in favor and none opposed, the motion passes. All right, that's approved. Thank you very much. Thank All you, right. Commissioners. Thank you. That concludes Thank our you. morning session. We will now break for lunch for 30 minutes. So we will come back at 136.
and we will ask all members of the public to voluntarily exit the meeting so that you do not have technical difficulties when you try to return. And um, we'll see everybody again at 136. Thank you. <laughs>